uh, results for the good of the country and, and for the American people. And I consider this to be a work committee, not a show committee. Um, there's other committees that, uh, that have different ideas, um, but we have reauthorizations to do. We have things that have to be done uh, to, uh, to govern. And, uh, and that's exactly what we are going to, uh, uh, we're gonna try to do. I'm honored to serve as chairman uh, of this committee and to have the opportunity uh, to help contribute uh, to the rich tradition and to the history uh, of this committee. And if you take just a minute and you look around the room, we changed things just a little bit. Um, we've added uh, all the chairman portraits, um, at least all of them that we could find uh, in storage. And they go back to 1947, um, starting right over here. Um, and that was our previous, or the previous committee, which was the Committee on Public Works. And so it goes around the, uh, uh, it goes around the room. Um, a few of them, obviously, in storage have fared better, better than others. Um, but uh, uh, regardless, I think if you've been chairman of this committee, then uh, you deserve to have your, uh, and you've had a painting, you deserve to have it up on the wall. Um, we're gonna have a key in everybody's uh, desk drawer as well, so if you wanna read uh, about the, uh, the members, then uh, uh, please do, or the former chairman, um, please do. Uh, you know, and I want us to always be conscious of uh, the experiences and the successes and even the failures of those who, who came before us. Um, both Republicans and, uh, and Democrats alike. And all of us and all of them uh, have contributed to the, uh, the TNI's uh, legacy as one of the most important and effective committees um, in Congress. <clears throat> in 2001, I started with Don Young, who has obviously the most gargantuan painting um, in the room. And that was Don's personality. So it absolutely reflects his uh, uh, personality. But I've personally been involved in many of those successes that I talked about and the failures, um, and they weren't always the result of uh, members working out their differences to find common ground. And that's exactly what, um, what I expect on the, uh, on the uh, committee. We're not gonna agree on every single issue, um, but I am gonna be open to work with every single person uh, on the committee. I'm not saying that um, just, to, uh, uh, just to say it. When I say it, I mean it. And, uh, and Rick, is, uh, Rick is gonna be right with me. Um, Rick is going to be my partner in this process um, as we work through some of these issues, whether that's FAA reauthorization, pipeline safety, Coast Guard reauthorization, um, WERDA, the water resources reauthorization, all of those bills. So if you've got something, um, come to me. I hate surprises. That's one thing you'll find out about me is I hate surprises. So bring it to me. Um, let's try to get it into the... Uh, uh, the text of the bill and find a way to, uh, to be able to move forward and, and get good product um, out on the, uh, the floor. Um, this isn't my first um, gavel. I have a little bit different uh, style of doing things. Um, just to run through those real quick, we will have four person panels. We're not gonna have these long drawn out hearings uh, that go on and on and on with multiple panels. Um, there'll be four people uh, testifying at, uh, at our hearings, very seldom, maybe once in a while we may have uh, a multiple panel of somebody that's coming from, uh, from the administration or something like that that's coming over because we want to give them the opportunity to be able to give their testimony and, uh, and get out. Um, I also give our subcommittees um, some autonomy. I'm not going to be showing up at every subcommittee and, and giving opening statements. Um, <clears throat> I want to give the subcommittees the chance to do their, um, their work. Um, we each have five minutes when we have the opportunity to uh, ask questions or talk a little bit. I'm not gonna gavel you down. If you have something to say, please say it, but don't abuse that, Eleanor. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, don't, abuse, um, don't abuse that uh, opportunity, but if you got something to say, say it. Um, just say it, and uh, we have some long-winded people on both sides of, uh, uh, of the aisle, so, uh, uh, so please don't, uh, don't abuse that. Um, I don't like gotcha games. Uh, again, this is a work committee, not a, uh, uh, not a show committee. And, uh, and I think we ought to be thinking about, too, as we move forward in the committee, we gotta remember we're the legislative branch of government. <clears throat> Since uh, Rick and I got here and we came in together in 2001, we got sworn in. But I've seen a slow and in some cases deliberate erosion of the legislative powers over the executive branch. And what I mean by that is the bureaucrats 
within the executive branch. And I think we need to think moving forward on how we get some of that back. I hate to see bureaucrats have more power in government than the members of Congress, the people that represent their districts. And so I wanna be thinking in terms of that. And I don't care which administration it is. We're gonna have more Republican administrations. We're gonna have more Democrat administrations. And it's the bureaucrats that are embedded in those agencies are the ones to me um, that are the problem with so many of the, uh, uh, of the agencies uh, out there. So I want us to be thinking in terms of that uh, as we move forward. Um, see, I think <clears throat> I didn't even use my opening statement and I don't need to. But I do want to introduce the new members on our side, and then I'm going to give Rick the opportunity to. You notice he's got a bigger chair than I do. Um, I took the, uh, this is the traditional um, chair. It's a whole lot more comfortable than, than, uh, than Rick's chair. But uh, <clears throat> um, Rick, I have the chance to introduce his new members here in just a minute. Um, Lance Gooden, we have from Texas. Where's Lance at? Did he even make it to the hearing this morning? Uh-oh. Tracy Mann um, from Texas, or I mean from uh, uh, Kansas. <clears throat> Burgess Owen from Utah. Where's Burgess at? Got it. Um, Rudy Yakim from Indiana. There's Rudy. Um, Laura Chavez de Reamer um, from Oregon. Chuck Edwards, North Carolina. Tom Keene, New Jersey. Where's Tom? Where's Tom? Anthony Esposito, New York. Where's Anthony? Eric Burleson from Missouri, great state of Missouri. Um, John James, Michigan. <laughs> Derek Van Orden from Wisconsin. Um, Brandon Williams, New York. Mark Molinaro, New York. Mike Collins, Georgia. Mike Gazell, Mississippi. John Duarte, California. John's not here. Aaron Bean, Florida. Aaron's not here. So we are excited, obviously, to have all the new members on the committee. We've got a lot of new members uh, on our side of the, uh, the aisle. But again, I want to welcome um, both the new and uh, the old members or the members that's been around for a while. And with that, I recognize Ranking Member Larson for, uh, for his statement. Thank you, Chairman Graves. Uh, and I want to welcome all the members of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee uh, for the 118th Congress. Those of you who are returning to the committee know what a unique and uh, uh, important opportunity that we have. Not only is the work that we do here important to every single congressional district in the country, we're able to do it in a bipartisan way, despite some of the polarization that we see in other parts of Congress. In fact, if you want excitement, you can leave this room, take a right-hand turn, and then take a left-hand turn, and there's the Oversight Committee and the Judiciary Committee, and that's where all the excitement is. If you want work, it's right here in the TNI room. And uh, so we're looking forward to it. I want to echo what uh, Chair Graves said about uh, working together. Um, I expect that we will have differences on some things. We fully expect to do that. We fully expect to have the debate, take the votes, and move on to the next thing in order to get to the, a bipartisan solution at the end of, end of any, in any debates that we have. It, we can do it, I know we can do it. We've done it before in this committee, and we can do it again in this committee. Look forward to working, uh, working with Sam on that. I wanna briefly introduce our new committee members. Uh, we have two new com com committee members who are not new to Congress. They were here uh, in the late, uh, late 117th Congress. Pat Ryan from New York's 18th District uh, is uh, uh, not here yet, but uh, Mary Patola, representing the great state of Alaska, is here as well. In addition, we have five newly elected members joining our committee. Rob Menendez from New Jersey's 8th District. Val Hoyle from Oregon's 4th. Amelia Sykes from Ohio's 13th. Hillary Skolton from Michigan's 3rd. And Valerie Fushi joins us from North Carolina's 4th District. And I welcome all the members, in, uh, to the, uh, welcome the new members and all the members to the uh, committee. 
Uh, we look forward to working with you. I do want to make a comment on the chair, and I do want to confirm for you. One, I didn't ask for the bigger chair. That would have been rude and out of place for someone who's uh, in a ranking position. But it is the bigger chair. It is, uh, I will guarantee, the harder chair. And um, Sam gets the softer chair. But we will be ready to poke you awake if it gets too comfortable over there, Sam, and so we can move, uh, move, move the committee forward. Thanks so much, uh, and I yield back. Okay, um, thank you, Ranking Member Larson. Again, Rick and I came in together a long time ago, and, and uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to working with him. Pursuant to Clause 2A, House Rule 11, the first order of business for the committee's uh, consideration is adoption of the rules of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure for the 118th Congress. A copy of the proposed committee rules together with a summary of the proposed changes to the rules for the 117th Congress was distributed both electronically in advance is also available in the hearing room. For those of you who've been on the committee previously, um, you will see that the rules are very similar to those that have been in place in previous Congresses. However, the committee rules have been revised to include updating the language to reflect recent committee practices, such as removing the requirements for the publishing of uh, compilation of laws and subcommittee section by sections, modernizing language to reflect the use of electronic devices rather than just cell phones, making necessary technical and conforming changes to meet the House rules adopted in January and adjusting the subcommittee ratios to conform with the new full committee ratio. We're able to coordinate these changes with Ranking Member Larson and appreciate, I do appreciate working with us uh, and your staff on this package. Um, I now recognize Mr. Larson for a statement on the proposed rules. Thank you, uh, Chair. The changes to the committee rules are large, uh, largely conform to um, the changes to the committee rules are largely changes to conform with the House rules for the 118th Congress. In addition, there's some stylistic changes that are the prerogative of the majority. I do want to thank Chairman for working with us in a bipartisan manner on committee rules. I urge adoption of the rules and yield back the balance of my time. Do any other member wish to be recognized in a statement on the committee's proposed rules? Seeing none, is there further discussion on the committee's proposed rules? Seeing none, the proposed rules are open for amendment at any point. Are there any amendments to the committee's proposed rules? Seeing none, I recognize Mr. Larson for a motion. <clears throat> Move the rules of the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure now before us be approved and adopted as the rules of the committee for the 118th Congress. <clears throat> the question is on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to, and the proposed rules are adopted. Pursuant to House rules, the rules on the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure for the 118th Congress will be printed in the congressional record made available in electronic form to all members of the committee and the public on the committee's website. Thanks, Corey. <clears throat> now the committee will move to approve the subcommittee chairman and ranking members. The rosters for the full committee and each subcommittee listing the chairman and ranking members was, was distributed in advance and are available in the hearing room today. I now recognize myself for a statement <clears throat> for five minutes. So I'm very excited uh, for the new and returning chairs that we have leading the subcommittees. Let me start with the newest additions. Uh, Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania is going to be chair of economic development and public buildings and emergency management. Representative Perry served, uh, he served on this committee. Uh, since coming to Congress in 2013. And with his near decade of TNI experience, he is very well equipped um, to successfully um, lead one of our busiest subcommittees as they oversee federal disaster uh, preparation, mitigation, and our recovery uh, programs, the reduction of waste in federal office space, and the implementation of programs and policies to spur economic development. That was the first committee I chaired, by the way. Next, Representative Troy Nels of Texas, Ms. Troy, <clears throat> is going to chair Railroads, Pipelines, and Hazardous Materials Subcommittee. Uh, I'm confident in his experience and knowledge, and he's going to provide an invaluable uh, expertise um, when he leads that subcommittee in developing pipeline safety, uh, reauthorization bill this year, and conducting oversight on Amtrak, and, and uh, many more things, obviously. Um, we also have four returning subcommittee leaders, and I know that they will continue to contribute greatly to the success of the committee and their new positions as subcommittee chairs. Representative Rick Crawford is going to chair highways and transit. Um, Representative Daniel Webster is going to chair Coast Guard and maritime transportation. And Representative Garrett Graves is going to uh, chair the aviation subcommittee. 
And lastly, David Rouser is going to chair the Water Resources and Environment um, Subcommittee. I look forward to working. Um, with the, it's a great, strong group of, uh, uh, of leaders, and I'm excited for them to bring their perspectives and uh, to the obviously important work that, uh, that our subcommittees are going to be doing. With that, I yield, uh, I yield back, and I recognize Mr. Larson for a statement on subcommittee ranking members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yesterday at the Democratic Caucus organizational meeting, the caucus elected six subcommittee ranking members. Uh, Representative Steve Cohen is ranking member of the subcommittee on aviation. Representative Salud Carbajal, ranking member on the subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. Representative Dina Titus, ranking member of the subcommittee on economic development, public buildings, and emergency management. Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, ranking member of the subcommittee on highways and transit. Representative Donald Payne Jr., ranking member of the subcommittee on railroads, pipelines, and hazardous materials. And Representative Grace Napolitano, ranking member of the subcommittee on water resources and the environment. Uh, they're all looking forward to uh, working uh, with uh, your team. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're looking forward to um, back first subcommittee is hearing first subcommittee hearing this next week, as I understand. Additionally, I just note the caucus also elected Representative Greg Stanton as the vice ranking member for um, uh, on our side for the 118th Congress. With that, I yield back. Do any members wish to be recognized for a statement on the uh, subcommittee chairman and ranking members? Seeing none, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I recognize Mr. Larson for a motion. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I move the subcommittee chairs and ranking members as set forth in the rosters be approved and adopted for the 118th Congress. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. All right. Now, the final order of business before the committee is to approve subcommittee assignments, and the rosters for the subcommittees were distributed in advance electronically and are also available in the hearing room today and I now recognize myself um, for a quick statement. I do want to thank Ranking Member Larson for working with us to determine subcommittee ratios. Um, we have an aggressive agenda ahead of us uh, this Congress which I've already, already talked about. And the work of our committee is going to be guided by individuals with a variety of backgrounds and perspectives and that's something else that makes this committee uh, interesting. It is the largest committee but that also gives us a lot of variety in terms of, of uh, knowledge and institutional knowledge in this room. We have members who are truck drivers, we have members who are pilots, farmers, um, small business owners, former state and local legislators, um, former law enforcement officials, just to name a few of the things um, that, uh, that I've noticed from, uh, from some of our members. These are very diverse uh, experiences that are gonna be useful as we tackle uh, a lot of that busy work that we have uh, before us. And with that, I yield. Uh, back and recognize Mr. Larson for a statement on subcommittee assignments. Uh, thank you, Chair. I uh, um, don't have any long statement, just to briefly say that we are equally excited to get moving on uh, the variety pack of issues that we deal with in this committee. I think at some, sometimes uh, we'll be surprised about the things that are in our, um, uh, in our jurisdiction, uh, as well as we'll find that other committees are surprised about the things that we believe are in our jurisdiction. Um, and so we'll have to deal with that as well. But we're lo looking forward to it, uh, and uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Do any other members wish to be recognized for a statement on subcommittee assignments? Seeing none, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I now recognize Mr. Larson for a motion. Pursuant to House Democratic Caucus rules, the Democratic members of the committee met yesterday to select their subcommittees. The results of that selection process reflect in the roster we're considering today, or just adoption. And now I'm being uh, given a different one. And I move the subcommittee assignments to set forth in the rosters to be approved and adopted for the 118th Congress. The question is on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Motions agreed to. All right. Pursuant to Rule 6 of the Rules of the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure, the Chairman notes that the presence of a quorum uh, for the actions taken on all committee business today, um, without objection, it's so ordered, and I'd ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make all necessary technical um, clarifying and conforming changes to each item adopted today to reflect the actions of the committee. Without objection, that is also so ordered. I will remind members that we are about to move into our full committee hearing 
uh, but the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, we now have completed our uh, organizational business for the day, and the committee is adjourned. quick as we can.
committee will come to order. I'd ask unanimous consent that the chairman be authorized to declare a resource recess at any time during today's hearing without objection. That is so ordered. I now recognize myself for the purposes of an opening statement. I do point out that I, in uh, my opening before, that I said that um, we will have four-person panels. I see we have a five-person panel. My staff has just taken note of that. And, <laughs> That'll be corrected, but I do appreciate all of our witnesses um, being here. Robust and, and respectful discussions are very much a part of this, uh, of this process, and, and which brings us to today's hearing, which is entitled The State of the Transportation Infrastructure and Supply Chain Challenges, which kicks off our activity for the 118th Congress. America has a vast transportation network that is essential to the nation's economic competitiveness and the movement of people and goods, both nationwide and globally, is integral to, uh, obviously, Americans' quality of life. Vulnerabilities within our transportation network were laid bare during the COVID-19 pandemic and were only made worse by stifling uh, regulation. The Infrastructure Investment Act, Investment and Jobs Act, um, IAJA, signed into law on November 15, 2021, provided $1.2 trillion roughly half of which went forward, uh, went towards programs that are under this committee's um, jurisdiction. I did not support the IIJA. However, I do accept that it is now the law of the land. What we have to do is make sure that Congress, and in particularly this committee, that we ensure that the money from the IIJA is spent responsibly and is directed towards making our nation's transportation supply chain more efficient and more resilient. We owe it to the American people to uh, uh, to do just that. So with that, I recognize Ranking Member Larson uh, for his opening statement. Uh, you now can have the rest of your time as well on the opening statement. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, thanks so much for holding this hearing. I appreciate it. As committee Democrats organized this week, we set priorities for this Congress to promote investments in cleaner, greener, safer, and more, uh, more accessible transportation network to ensure these investments create jobs and opportunities to build capacity in our communities as they put federal dollars to work, to restore and protect our environment, and to safeguard our nation's economic sustainability and competitiveness. I know members on both sides of the aisle share many of these goals, and we do stand ready to work together in good faith where we can find common ground. We have come a long way in two years. At the start of the 117th Congress, we faced an unprecedented economic challenge as COVID-19 placed incredible stress on American workers and families, as well as massive pressure on supply chains. These pressures expose the fragilities of an aging, congested, and overburdened transportation and infrastructure network that was dangerously overdue for an overhaul. Last Congress, we finally responded decisively to bolster our economy and limit the fallout from the immediate crisis facing our nation while modernizing and transforming the way people and goods move with the passage of several landmark bills. The American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL. This committee had the largest role in delivering the BIL and will continue to focus on the implementation of the $660 billion that we have oversight, where we have oversight. This dollar amount and the number of grant opportunities is significantly larger than any previous transportation or infrastructure authorization that the DOT has administered. And the pace at which these dollars are reaching communities is impressive. DOT has already made available over $150 billion in highway, transit, and airport formula money over fiscal years 22 and 23. And these are not federally controlled dollars. This funding passes through the DOT, US DOT directly to states and local governments to build projects, projects designed and built by private sector construction and engineering firms and workers they hire in everyone's districts. That's why that you will hear me say frequently that transportation means jobs. States have launched 29,000 new projects with federal highway formula funding in fiscal year 22, according to an analysis from the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. That's at least one new project underway in every congressional district in the country. The BIL also provides funding for competitive grant programs, and to date, the administration has announced funding for 6,900 projects under competitive grants to over 4,000 communities nationwide for roads, bridges, rail, buses, ferries, ports, for safety projects and other infrastructure needs. BIL, BIL grants provide strong support for projects 
in geographically diverse areas. Under the RAISE grant program, funds are awarded evenly between rural and urban areas. In the latest round of infra grants totaling $1.5 billion, 15 of 26 projects selected were in rural areas. The Rural Surface Transportation Grant Program awarded $274 million to 12 projects in its first funding round as well. And it supports major projects that are larger than any one state or community could advance, such as the recently announced grants for the Hudson Tunnels in New York and the Brent Spence Bridge connecting Ohio and Kentucky. BIL also ex uh, includes grants exclusively for tribes and local communities, such as the Tribal Transportation Program Safety Funds and Safe Streets and Roads for All to ensure these communities reap the benefits of transportation uh, investments. So we have four more years of this bill to implement for states and local communities and tribes uh, that we have um, oversight uh, to continue. We need to ensure that uh, investments represent a benefit um, for local priorities, put people to work in our districts, and maintain and modernize our infrastructure. However, this won't happen if we play chicken with the U.S. ability to invest, especially invest in our competitiveness and threaten the U.S. economy with a catastrophic default on our debt. That would set back infrastructure projects immeasurably. So we need to ensure that we uh, find a way to come up with a debt ceiling deal so that infrastructure investments and the money that comes with it are not cut or eliminated uh, over time. And I hope we can uh, focus some of our work on defining what would happen if there was a default uh, and uh, what would happen to transportation investments. Um, I just I look forward to working with you. We were getting here today about how inflation is undercutting the purchasing power of federal transportation dollars. We'll hear today as well about how the BIL has invested in uh, U.S. Uh, competitiveness with, uh, in our transportation infrastructure. And finally, with the time I have left, I want to emphasize the human infrastructure, the need to develop today's necessary workforce and to build a pipeline for new workers in the next generation of uh, infrastructure investment. I want to thank our witnesses today. With that, I yield back. Thank you. <clears throat> now I'd like to uh, welcome all of our witnesses um, here today and, and uh, thank you for coming in and for your testimony. Just to explain the light system real quick, um, green means go, yellow means you're running out of time, and red means you're out of time. But I'd ask unanimous consent that the witness's full statements be included in the record and without objection that is so ordered. As your written testimony has been made part of the record, uh, the committee asks that you uh, try to limit your remarks to five minutes. And with that, um, we have uh, Mr. Chris Spear, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Trucking Association. Thanks for being here. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Larson, and members of this committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. For 90 years, the ATA has helped Congress shape its understanding of our nation's infrastructure needs and supply chain challenges. And today's oversight is both welcome and timely. The IIJA provided a 38% increase in road and bridge funding, a historic investment not witnessed since the Eisenhower era. Prior to passage, ATA testified 25 times before the House and Senate, sharing how the decaying state of our nation's infrastructure is hamstringing America's ability to compete with rising global powers like China. In short, a first world economy cannot survive a developing world infrastructure. While the ATA strongly supported the IIJA, it was not a perfect piece of legislation. No bill is. This hearing provides oversight of $1.2 trillion of taxpayer earned income. An industry that makes up just 4% of the vehicles on our nation's highways, yet pays nearly half the tab into the Federal Highway Trust Fund. We ask that every dollar be spent wisely and in accordance with what Congress instructed. To that end, ATA objects to the Federal Highway Administration's memorandum directing the IIJ monies be spent on existing roads and bridges and not new construction. Not only does this directly conflict with congressional intent, it does nothing to address congestion, improve safety, and reduce emissions. Our industry loses nearly $75 billion a year sitting in congestion annually. That's 425,000 drivers sitting idle every year. That's 6.87 billion gallons of fuel, more than $34 billion of wasted energy. 
That's 67.3 million metric tons of CO2 being pumped into our environment. Let me be clear. Funding existing infrastructure alone does nothing to fix congestion. It just makes it worse. Congress has proven that it can do the right thing. Passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Passage of the CHIPS Act. We need more of this. We need new secure truck parking capacity as proposed by the Bipartisan Truck Parking Safety and Improvement Act. We need a greater emphasis on our workforce. The IIJA, including elements of the Bipartisan Drive Safe Act, will do what none of the 49 states have done, requiring training and technology for young talent to operate our equipment. What the IIJA didn't do is require inward-facing cameras, opposed by drivers young and old, union and non-union. Requiring a company camera be in a driver's workspace every minute of every hour, including the sleeper berth, is intrusive, disrespectful, and opens a prying door into the other transportation modes. Your oversight is warranted. Lastly, we need a realistic discussion about our nation's energy and environmental policies. For four decades, ATA has worked with the EPA, producing phases one and two emissions reduction rules. To date, 98.5% of all emissions have been removed from our tailpipes. In fact, 60 trucks today emit what one truck emitted in 1988. This is not a matter of if we get to zero, but when, and we will get there, just not on the timelines being proposed in California. Their rush to zero makes their timeline and targets unachievable, and they will fail. The rare minerals needed for millions of 5,000 pound truck batteries the infrastructure needed to charge them, and the additional electricity needed to power our trucks, full scale, doesn't yet exist and won't anytime soon. Again, we're committed to a cleaner environment. We've proven that. We simply ask we be realistic about the path forward. Do that, and we'll have the best infrastructure and the strongest, most sustainable economy like no other. I thank the committee and you. Thank you very much. Now, we now turn to uh, uh, Ian Jeffries, who is the um, President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Railroad Association. Thanks for being here, Ian. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Larson, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today representing America's freight railroads. And thank you also to my colleagues and friends at the table today who are all critical to the integrated supply chain. Collectively, we work together to move the goods the nation relies on to grow and thrive. Taking a moment to reflect, railroads were a prominent part of the national discourse over the past year. From untangling pandemic-related supply chain challenges to a historic collective bargaining round that culminated at the end of the year, railroads were in the national spotlight like never before. Certainly, this level of, ex this level of exposure has its pros and cons, but one core truth was clear. Freight rail is critical to the economy. To that end, while it is important to reflect on and learn from past experiences, it is equally important to focus on the here and now with an eye toward the future. And so I hope you take away four things today from my remarks. First, safety is at the forefront of everything railroads do. Our industry operates a 24-7, 365 outdoor assembly line handling a mix of traffic across every terrain imaginable, and we do it safely. Every day working toward the ultimate goal of zero injuries and zero deaths. We have more work to do, and we've got a shoulder into it to keep driving towards that end game. The past decade has been the safest history for the railroads, and we're safer than almost every industrial sector you can compare us to. Our employees de deserve immense thanks and appreciation for their role in safely moving America's freight day in and day out. Their commitment is unparalleled. Yes, last year's bargaining round was challenging, yet we are glad to see the terms of the agreement go into effect, including historic pay increases, the highest in five decades, maintenance of best-in-class health care, and a path to further improve quality of life and work-life balance issues that remain out in our industry. Know this. Railroads continue to provide some of the highest compensated jobs with the best benefits of any industry in the country. 
And yet, we recognize that employee relations is a never-ending process. We are committed to modernizing jobs to reflect evolving employee values and priorities, and in turn, building an appropriately staffed and more resilient railroad to not only serve today's demand, but the demand that will come in the future. And this is happening on property as we sit here today. Hiring continues throughout our industry at a time when we read about countless layoffs in industries every morning in the paper. Uh, railroads continue to hire, with train and engine workers up nearly 10% in the past 12 months and overarching rail uh, employment levels up just over 6% as well. Third, our investments, not only in our employees, but in our top rated infrastructure, is creating a network built to serve customers today and into the future. Each year, railroads invest billions of their own funds to maintain and expand their infrastructure. The result? the highest rated infrastructure in the country, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. For context, railroads invested an average of $24 billion annually of their own funds over the past 15 years. That's one billion more than the investments Congress made in this year's historic level of spending in rail and multimodal programs as part of the IIJA and the Omnibus combined. So if the IIJA's investments are historic, I guess railroads make history every year with their investments. Last, in no small part because of these factors I've outlined, service is improving. Over the past year, we certainly had service challenges and many of our customers didn't receive service that they deserve and respect, expect. And so we've kept a shoulder into that, working hard and uh, the results are coming. Vol velocity, terminal dwell, uh, trip plant compliance, other measurements, other metrics are improving across the board and even our regulator, the STB, recognizes that as well. Still more work to do and uh, we're continuing to, to drive those processes forward. Now turning to matters of direct import today, AAR and its members absolutely supported the infrastructure bill. Of course, no bill is perfect, as Chris said, and certainly we had issues with some of the pay-fors. We'd like to get back to a, a user pay structure with the highway system, but it had numerous positives. Specifically, the creation of a multi-billion dollar grade crossing elimination initiative will pay dividends into the future, reducing accidents, limiting motorist de delay, and increasing freight fluidity. And while we proudly fund our own infrastructure, we'll work diligently with our public partners in states and towns across America so that they can leverage the Chrissy program, mega program, infra program, and other grant programs out there. Looking at agency oversight, we continue to have concerns about the Federal Railroads Administration's view on technology and technological deployment. We need a champion, we need a partner about uh, getting new technology that's gonna drive safety to its next levels, not uh, one that's gonna, gonna hold us back. And so we can get into that further, but I see my time is running out. And thank you for uh, holding this today and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Mr. Jeffries. And now I'm going to yield to uh, Ms. Hoyle, for introduction of our next um, witness. Uh, thank you, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Larson, for the opportunity to introduce Jeff Firth from Hamilton Construction, one of Oregon's largest construction firms. Um, he has deep ties in Southwest Oregon, and we both live in Springfield, Oregon. He is here today on behalf of the Associated, Associated General Contractors of America, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce him to you, Mr. Chairman, and to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Firth, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you for inviting me to testify on this vitally important topic. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Firth, and I am the Vice President of Hamilton Construction Company and a board member of the Associated General Contractors of America, or AGC, where I serve as Vice Chair of the Highway and Transportation Division. AGC is a leading association in the construction industry, representing more than 27,000 firms, including America's leading general contractors and specialty contracting firms, many of which are small businesses. AGC contractors are both union and open shop and are engaged in the construction on nation's infrastructure, including roads, bridges, airports, transit systems, levees and dams, and more. In 2020, 91% of firms within the construction industry had 20 or fewer employees. Hamilton Construction Company has been building bridges and highways as a heavy civil contractor since 1939. Hamilton has partnered with owners to deliver numerous award-winning complex bridges, highways, dams, and other critical infrastructure projects. We have four divisions that operate throughout the West. In my testimony today, I'll discuss the status of the construction industry, including the challenges that lie ahead 
for rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, represents the most significant infusion of investment, including over $350 billion dedicated to roads and bridges in our infrastructure since the enactment of the interstate highway system since 1950. However, inflation and supply chain constraints have threatened the success of the IIJA. In my testimony today, I will discuss the challenges that have emerged from the industry, even as some conditions improve. Infrastructure projects costs continue to climb and rising construction material prices and shortages. Material prices in have increased and doubled or even tripled in some cases. The construction industry is facing material challenges that reach far and wide. In fact, a recent survey of AGC members found that 93% of construction companies are experiencing long lead times and or allocations, less than full shipments for construction materials. Supply chain disruptions from the pandemic have inflated the cost of construction materials and made project delivery schedules and product availability more uncertain. Construction firms in situations where if they are able to, will pass along the rising materials, uh, prices, excuse me, in order to remain successful. Unfortunately, the lead time in bidding these projects is so long that they are unable to predict the availability and price of some of these materials. We are experiencing an unprecedented burden with bidding procurement of new projects. As you can imagine, the impacts are especially devastating to small and DBE construction firms that lack the resources to absorb these unexpected costs. The industry is also facing uncertainty around Buy America requirements included in the IIJA, which expands domestic sourcing requirements to all construction materials on federally assisted projects, such as affordable housing, drinking water, transportation projects, and more. I want to be clear, AGC supports sensible efforts to incentivize the growth of domestic manufacturing capacity to restore balance to the supply chain. There is still significant confusion among industry, federal, state, and local agencies regarding the difference between a construction material and a manufactured product, and what manufacturing processes must occur domestically for construction materials. There is also heartburn within the construction industry about needing a Buy America waiver in the future and the low likelihood in it being granted on, based on history. To make the waiver process even more problematic because of an executive order, federal agencies must submit waivers for items not made in America to the Office of Management and Budget. At Hamilton Construction, this new requirement has caused us confusion. Owners should have a better handle on what is being specified on their projects and ensure that these materials are available to buy America requirements. Most owners simply pass the onus on to the contractor then stipulate that they will not pay the contractor until they find something that works. As you can imagine, this is hard to do if there's nothing out there that qualifies as an equivalent. While the IIJA provides a historic level of funding in our infrastructure, we're still recovering from a global pandemic, addressing supply chain crisis, and implementing new federal requirements that were part of the IIJA, which has created challenges for those of us tasked with rebuilding our infrastructure. But let me be clear, if Congress did not pass the IIJA, the impacts on the transportation contractors would have been significant with likely a cut of 20 to 30 percent in projects by the states. I thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Firth. Now we'll move to uh, Mr. Roger Gunther. Did I get that right? Uh, yes, Chairman, that's correct. Executive uh, Director of Port Houston. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Larson and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be with uh, you today. And thank you, Chairman, for taking the time to come and see our port uh, late last summer, uh, see what it's all about. Again, my name's Roger Gunther, and I'm the Executive Director of Port Houston. And the Houston Ship Channel serves the largest port in the nation, handling more waterborne tonnage cargo uh, than any other port in the United States either by annual tonnage as well as the number of ships by a wide margin. Our ship channel sustains more than 3.2 million jobs each year and, and more than $800 billion in annual economic impact for the United States. Now I can and I will speak to the challenges and opportunities specifically about Port Houston. I don't speak for other ports, but I'm quite sure these are similar issues across the nation. Over the past two years, Houston has not been immune to the challenges of a global supply chain that has been overwhelmed. Our strong partnerships with labor and industry played and continue to play a critical role in our ability to push cargo through our terminals and accommodate the increase in cargo 
uh, our share of the Gulf continues to experience. Strained, unprecedented demand, we have seen firsthand how critical each logistic set segment of the supply chain is for the efficient movement of freight, and I can tell you seaports are one of those critical links. As demand peaked, terminals became congested as import and export cargo were limited by many, many factors and container facilities maxed out the capacity because they had no place to go and nowhere to take them. So they sat on our terminals. To ensure a resilient supply chain and be prepared for future demands, investment must be made in our nation's seaports where cargo continues to rapidly grow and where private investments are being made near the ports in distribution centers for imported consumer goods and for manufactured goods that are exported, uh, like petrochemical prod products and agricultural commodities of the like, and, and again, exported globally. As Congress provides money for infrastructure, those resources should be focused on federal assets, the roads, the rails, the waterways, and perhaps even nearby uh, inland depots that are critical to serving the fluidity of our nation ports. I can give you an example of what's going on in Houston. In 2022, as the U.S. container imports were flat, Houston, Houston grew by 19 percent, and our exports were up 18 percent compared to an overall decline in exports of 5 percent. That's container imports and exports. To put it simply, Houston is an example that is exponentially out pacing cargo growth around the nation, and we have to speed up many projects to try to accommodate this continued growth, and we cannot wait. Ports are responsible for capital investments of their own terminals, such as wharf improvements and facilities to accommodate this growth, and we are making as ports those improvements. But it must be a federal priority and a federal obligation to make the capital investments on the water side and land side in our channels and highway infrastructure that serve our nation's ports to maintain the resiliency and fluidity going forward. Houston and ports most critical to the nation's economy should be prioritized for infrastructure investments. If not, the nation's busiest supply chains are vulnerable to disruption. Another example, the Houston Ship Channel has been underfunded by 50 to 60% for operations and maintenance dollars over the past several years resulting in draft restrictions throughout our channel. We receive 18 cents per ton of cargo compared to the national average of 60 cents per ton of cargo. Houston serves as the gateway for the Gulf for many global trade routes, and without an adequately maintained channel, vessels must leave behind cargo, whether at their point of uh, export or import port of origin, which exacerbates the, the, the chain backups. In Houston, we've been able to speed our deepening and widening project, Project 11, by pre-funding the segments of the dredging, shaving off already five to seven years of a traditional timeline. Each day earlier that we deliver this project, which serves more than 200 waterfront facilities in our own port, it generates $366,000 a day of economic impact to the nation. In the past few years, the uh, the federal government has funded several other ports with federal dollars to finish their dredging projects to completion, and adding the Port of Houston to that list would have enormous positive impact on the nation's economy. As I mentioned earlier, each segment of the supply chain, including the highways, rails, and uh, those trades that support them are necessary. As my colleagues here at the table have mentioned, and Mr. Chairman and committee members, I applaud your commitment to funding solutions to ensure we learn from the past supply chain crisis and are well prepared to minimize the next. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have later. Thank you. Uh, now we turn to Mr. Greg Regan, who's the president of Transportation Trades Department, AFL-CIO. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Larson for inviting me to testify at this committee's first hearing uh, of this new Congress. You might pull your mic a little closer. A little closer. Yep. I'm Greg Regan, President of the Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. I'm speaking today on behalf of 37 unions who build, operate, and maintain our nation's transportation systems, whose members are on the front line of our freight network. This hearing occurs at a pivotal moment. TTD has long advocated for making generational and much needed investments in infrastructure and transportation services to meet our growing freight and passenger needs. 
Because of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, there are already 7,000 projects underway that are putting Americans to work. That includes 3,800 bridge projects, improvements to nearly 70,000 miles of roads and highways, and the largest ever dedicated investment in our ports. These projects are creating jobs, growing the economy, and strengthening supply chains in rural and urban communities alike. Just yesterday, the DOT announced the first round of mega grant recipients, and we learned that long overdue freight needs are being met nationwide. This includes $250 million for improvements to the Brent Spence Bridge, which facilitates $400 billion in freight movement annually. Another $150 million will go to replace the I-10 Culcashu River Bridge in Louisiana, and, it will, and, that, and that will include a workforce agreement to target jobs and training opportunities to underserved communities. Other IIJA investments in ports and rural communities will improve the efficiency and reliability of our supply chain, not just in major cities, but also in communities like Tell City, Ohio, Columbus, Mississippi, Sanford, North Carolina, and many more. Cities and towns represented by every single member of this committee will benefit from these investments. These projects are not only helping to meet the demand of our freight network through more modern and efficient transportation infrastructure, they're also ensuring that millions of workers will have higher wages and better benefits. This economic opportunity is possible because of the Biden administration's whole of government approach to supporting workers and creating good union jobs. Coupled with the CHIPS Act, the IIJA will also ensure our domestic manufacturing capabilities are resilient to sudden shocks or rapid changes in the global economy. Policies like Build America, Buy America in the law will significantly increase domestic manufacturing of iron, steel, and other manufactured goods. And the CHIPS Act will serve as an historic boost to domestic advanced manufacturing. But these investments and policies enshrined into our law over the past two years are only part of the picture. If we are serious about strengthening our national supply chain, we must also address the fundamental and structural problems that cause the crisis, which cannot be solved through investment alone. Since the beginning of this pandemic, the most significant supply chain challenges we faced were not the result of inadequate in infrastructure, but were largely due to business decisions made by employers in key freight industries that put profits over workers and consumers. Their decisions in the years leading up to the pandemic were not driven by better service, but rather by shareholder concerns. Thus, they rendered themselves completely unprepared for the stress the pandemic placed on our own supply chain. Even as the system came crashing down around them, freight companies continued to rake in rec record profits while your constituents paid the price. While my written testimony goes into much greater detail, I would like to highlight just a handful of examples for the members of this committee. In the years leading up, up to the pandemic and during its onset, the freight rail industry furloughed 45,000 rail workers, a staggering 30% of its total workforce. Not because these workers weren't needed, but were simply because the railroads wanted to maximize profits. When consumer demand spiked, the railroads simply couldn't keep up because they had already slashed their workforce and operating equipment to the bone. The trucking industry has complained of so-called workforce shortages, but the truth is they have slashed wages and benefits and made working conditions so bad that workers who would otherwise be interested in driving are simply looking elsewhere. When our ports needed trucks and trains to move cargo so they could offload ships, the capacity just was not there. Elsewhere in the airline industry, some are pushing the same false narrative about workforce shortages with the goal of reducing pilot training requirements and boosting profits. As we prepare for an FAA reauthorization, we must reject any efforts to go backwards on safety for any reason, least of which being profit margins. And in the maritime industry, the lack of a comprehensive national maritime strategy has left our country subject to the whims of the largely foreign-owned shipping conglomerates, since we do not have the sea lift capacity to meet our, meet our own export and import needs. We can loosen this chokehold and increase our competitiveness by supporting the construction and operation of Jones Act vessels, enabling US-built, US-flag, and US-crewed feeder vessels to carry a portion of America's trade will ensure a more resilient supply chain. Finally, Pursuing a more efficient supply chain cannot be an excuse to eliminate or weaken longstanding labor, labor laws such as collective bargaining rights, fatigue protections, training and qualification requirements, and others. Doing so would only harm the workers that, are tireless, that tirelessly keep the economy and the flow of goods moving. But it is the dedication and expertise of these workers, in addition to the investments that, we are, that are currently being made, that give me the confidence that we will deliver a stronger and more resilient supply chain in the years to come. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Now we will open it up for questions from the uh, committee, and we'll start with Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ask unanimous consent to submit a uh, letter for the record from the Fertilizer Institute on their concerns about supply chain challenges. 
Without objection, so order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the panelists for being here today. I want to start with you, Mr. Spear. Looking back at the COVID-19 pandemic, in your estimation, what could the federal government have done better to manage the public health concerns at the same time maintaining the continuity of our supply chain? Uh, How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. I, seriously, I think, look, it's our first time, all of us together, dealing with a global pandemic. I mean, there, there were, you know, a lot of things thrown at our country, our economy, our industry, that we had to adjust to very quickly in order to make certain that store shelves had, you know, milk, eggs, bread, you know, gas stations had fuel. But then became the rush to get PPE, test kits, um, certainly the vaccine itself. That was moved largely by truck. And our industry stepped up to the plate when a lot of people stayed at home, not knowing you know, what impact this would have on their health, their family's health, real concerns. And isolated in the cab, you know, with those risks still in their minds, they still got in the cab. They still drove those loads to where they needed to be. They were the glue, certainly in the early weeks and months of the pandemic. And I think the inclusiveness uh, of, of government and industry to solve problems of this magnitude is absolutely essential. Uh, I can point to things where we had a lot of conflict between our government and the government of Canada. And our in, you know, inability to match bearings with public safety and health policy to get our trucks across the line, their largest trading partner. We're dependent on one another. And it just took two governments sitting down to hammer that out, and they didn't do it. So that, that's leadership, and I'm not pointing fingers. It's just a reality that has an impact on an industry like ours to serve the populace, to serve society on the basic needs that they have to have. I, I think that um, you know when we looked at the OSHA uh, announcement to require vaccines for employers with more than 100 employees, and my background coming off Senate Labor Committee, OSHA, uh, at DOL, we knew, my team and I, that they did not have the authority to do that. We did not want to go to court. That was something that we certainly could have sat down and worked out, but we'd ended up litigating it. It went to the Supreme Court, 6-3 decision, you know the outcome. A lot of waste of time on issues that we really should be sitting down and working collectively toward. But I can also point to a lot of good that came out of it as well. You know, I drove many instances across the country. We have a home in Wyoming. Seeing those billboards out in the cornfields thanking a trucker. Mm -hmm. Seeing the banners fly off the overpasses. Our drivers getting off an, uh, an interstate and being met by a police officer to escort them to where they can get a hot meal and a, and a shower. Mm -hmm. Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, church groups handing out baked goods at, at rest areas. Our image climbed to a level not even known possible. The, yeah. On that note, Ms., uh, Mr. Spear, I, I would say that you did this at a time when the trucking industry was suffering and continues to suffer through a, a massive driver deficit. Yeah. And, and on that note, I, sh I share your support, um, uh, as you outlined in your, in your testimony, make it easier for our constituents to choose a career in the trucking industry, such as ensuring that 18 to 20-year-old drivers who have a CDL can work across state lines. And now you've been supportive of that um, in the three-year pilot program that was included in IJA. How's that implementation going? It's, it's like everything in this town, slow, uh, slower than we would like, but you know, we've grown accustomed to it. I, I do think this program's gonna bear fruit. Uh, we've worked really hard in this committee to create a bipartisan understanding uh, of this block of talent, 18 to 20. But I'm also mindful, as you understand, that 49 states already allow an 18-year-old to drive. A class eight. They just can't cross state lines. Now that works pretty good from Redding, California down to San Diego. 20 minutes outside of Providence, Rhode Island, not so much. What we need to do is have good training and technology. None of the 49 states do that. This program that was put into the IIJ does. So we need to teach young talent how to safely and responsibly operate this equipment. Inserting an issue like forward-facing cameras, that was not part of the deal. That was not in the bill, and it's gonna cause, that's a matter, by the way, that most companies and their employees should negotiate out. Having a camera in your face, every minute of every hour, of every workday, that's not in the bill. 
and it's gonna limit companies from joining this program and putting young talent in a capacity where they can replace our aging workforce. So this is a concern, oversight is needed. I applaud you for shedding some light on this. We need to follow the law that you handed the agency. And so that is one area where I think it's gonna serve as a bit of a headwind in getting this program off the ground. Appreciate it, my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, first question's from Ms. Spear. First, I wanna recognize on page two that in your testimony in paragraph three, your uh, recognition that uh, this debt limit debate could have existential threats to our economy and certainly uh, to spending on uh, investments on our infrastructure if, uh, if, it gets if infrastructure spending gets wrapped up into this debate. So I wanna recognize that. Um, the, uh, uh, the, my question though, is I'm gonna put up a graphic up here if I can have a, a staff put up the graphic. Um, so in your testimony on page five, it'll get there. Um, on page five, you note the, uh, the December 16, 2021 memo um, and your concerns with it uh, about the, um, from the DOT uh, and your concerns that it will put, the, the guidance will force money into um, fixing infrastructure first as opposed to highway expansion. And this graphic does show in FY21, there's about 8.1 billion, this is Federal Highway Administration numbers, 8.1 billion in 2021 to, um, uh, highway expansion or reducing congestion. The memo comes out, the FY22 number is about 25% higher. Uh, it is not lower, it is not an indication that the memo had much of an impact, uh, if any impact at all, in the state's uh, ability, uh, any state's ability to invest in expansion or reducing congestion. And, uh, and then we have four more years left on the bill, so I, if you could help me understand the basis of your argument when at least the early numbers show that's not the case. Now, I will say the jury is still out, mm -hmm. but right now I think you ought to take a plea deal um, on your argument. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not there yet. Uh, candidly, you know, I think this is trending, it's encouraging, but it also begs the question, why have the memo at all? Why have the memo at all? Why do we have to draw lines between new and existing infrastructure? The emphasis and concern that we have is within the top 100 bottlenecks, which we provide you every year, we track it every year based on GPS data, shows by speed, where are the worst bottlenecks? Start with that and let's address them. What we don't wanna have is, is really nice roads and bridges and we're still sitting on them going nowhere. We need truck lanes, we need parking, we need new bridges, we need more capacity to move the freight. We're burning fuel and we're emitting CO2 just sitting there. That is the concern. I, and, and, and if I this trend continues, I, I, yeah. I can see that being resolved, but I don't see any need for the memo. I see, and I think that's a, that's a fair concern when you look at the competitive grants the administration has included with regards to highway expansion. Uh, in 2022, uh, 225 million through the RAISE program, 1.3 billion through the mega infra and rural grant programs were awarded that include highway uh, expansion as well. So. Uh, it does seem to he go headed that way. And, and uh, Mr. Firth, uh, good friends who are members of the AGC in Washington State, so this is not a, uh, certainly not an anti-organ question. I wanna clarify that immediately okay. for you. Um, but given, given these numbers and the AGC's argument um, on, the, uh, on highway expansion versus, uh, you know, in Washington State, we call fix it first preservation and maintenance, and we believe we actually do need to preserve and maintain our, our uh, existing infrastructure as well as invest in new infrastructure. Can you address what you see in these numbers and what AGC might respond? Yeah, first time I've seen these numbers. Sure, I understand. Time, but, uh, you know, 80% of the, of the funding is already on, you know, fix and repair of, of existing infrastructure and everything. And uh, the way I look at it is our infrastructure is over 50 years old and it needs to be, you know, repaired and I think having states being, having that flexibility to decide what is best for their uh, process or what their needs are, um, you know, will be good. Um, having a one size fix all policy, I don't think is very practical. Um, you know, as I was flying yesterday and I, from, from Oregon over and I'm, I'm flying over Montana and South Dakota and I'm just thinking of what their needs are versus Oregon or Washington's. Yeah, uh, sure. Well, and I appreciate that. You know, in Washington State, uh, you know, 21% of our transportation 
package past year was funded through the uh, um, through the uh, IAJA over, over the next several years. And so, the, and Washington State tends to use that money for preservation and maintenance because we have the third highest gas tax in the in the country. Now we're tied for lowest income tax in the country as well at zero. Um, so there's a trade-off, but um, that's that's our particular experience. But I think the numbers are starting to show that the memo is having no impact. So maybe there's a concern about why to issue it at all, but still I think the, the concerns being expressed don't really seem to yet match the, match the reality. Uh, with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Webster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gunther, have, does the port have any uh, problems uh, that dealing with permitting or other uh, forms of uh, restraint when you're trying to upgrade or maintain your, your infrastructure? Um, regarding our channels that I spoke about, you know, the, 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 obviously those are federal proje projects and we are the non-federal sponsor working with the Corps of Engineers to get those going. Um, uh, we need to you know, those are the investments that I'm talking about that we need to do. As far as permitting for our uh, ports, seaports that we invest in, the ports are investing in our dollars, uh, you know, per permitting's not, um, you know, exorbitant amount of, you know, strain on that relationship there. But, Is you know, we, we, we need to focus on um, you know the, the the monies that are allocated to the Corps of Engineers to you know from uh, from the federal government to make sure that we are uh, moving forward these projects and and uh, so that we stay ahead of what these needs are for serving our seaports um, with uh, deeper and wider channels and maintain channels the 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 maintenance of those channels to deliver the goods. So is there something Congress could do to to uh, speed up? I know the Corps sometimes. Hard to move, but um, we could speed up or help with those. Or is there some funding issue or other things that are need to be done in order to get the uh, channels open? Uh, sure, and you know we 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 really focus on you know uh, again the operation and maintenance funding. Uh, for instance, the Houston Ship Channel um, hasn't been at its authorized depth and width that it was authorized for for many years due to the lack of operation and maintenance funding. Um, you know, the, uh, um, we, we, we typically, it typically takes in our channel, for instance, 50, 60 million dollars a year to keep it property maintained and we get far less than that. Uh, the Corps gets far less than that to put in their work plan to, to keep it maintained. And, and, and we're in that situation now that uh, we've been underfunded for years and uh, we're about to a point where we're gonna become draft restricted again, which we have been in the past. And what that means, it puts a tremendous burden. Uh, uh, the vessels are light loaded. Uh, it puts more cost uh, on the goods that, that are to be shipped and it's passed along to uh, the consumer ultimately. So uh, I would stress the emphasis on making sure that our channels uh, that are, um, you know, most critical in terms of tonnage uh, and, and serving the supply chain, make sure that those channels uh, are funded through the, oper uh, you know, for operation and maintenance. So what, what depths are they approved to? Well, our particular channel, we're, we're, we're authorized to uh, operating depth of 45 feet. And, uh, you know, without going into detail, typically they'll, uh, you know, have some advanced maintenance on that. But, uh, you know, several times, and we're about to get to that point because there's not enough money in the core work plan right now uh, to uh, maintain the channel that we're about to be draft restricted probably as early as March. So what's the depth you could, you're at? Then that you get well. To it's 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 at 45 feet, but it's as it as the channel silts up, you know, it's going to be restricted to you know maybe a foot or two, and a, and a foot is a, a tremendous amount of cost to the 9,000 ships that come and go in the Houston Ship Channel every year that are restricted. So the uh, 
the idea is just more dredging. Yeah, to directing operation maintenance funds to to um, to our channels. Thank you very much. You'll back. Yeah, Eleanor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I would like to submit into the record a, a letter from the Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety that outlines important issues of trucking safety. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jeffries, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides $102 billion in total rail funding. This is a historic investment that will advance uh, our goal of reducing carbon emissions from transportation. In addition to mitigation, adapt adaptation is also an essential aspect of responding to climate change. Could you expand on how the industry is investing in climate resilient rail infrastructure? Well, thank you for that question and certainly a, a very top of mind point. So right now, freight, freight, freight rail is the most uh, fuel efficient, least environmentally intensive way of moving goods over land. Uh, one freight train, or excuse me, one, one gallon of diesel can move uh, one ton of freight about 500 miles. And one intermodal train will take about 200 trucks off the highway. What does that do? That reduces emissions, it reduces congestion, it reduces wear and tear on public infrastructure. And so as we stand here today, an immediate way to reduce emissions is to partner with my, my friend at the ATA and, and get that supply chain humming. So you're, you're going from truck to rail to truck, um, pulling trucks off the highway. Uh, but we can't just sit where we are right now and be happy with our, with our environmental performance. We've got to continue to drive that process forward. And that includes both out on the network, but also in the, in the yard. Um, so in the yard, we're investing in electric cranes, uh, emissions reduction technology, um, the technology that shuts off a locomotive so it's not idling, similar to what you have in your car at a, at a stoplight or stop sign. Um, but we're also investing in battery electric power, hydrogen power, uh, use, increased use of biofuels, uh, decreased friction between uh, wheel and track to increase glide. So there's a, there's a vast number of tools that are being deployed. And certainly the IJA provides significant opportunities to partner with the federal government, both in money coming out of the DOT, but also money coming out of DOE as well. And we're working with our members to leverage those opportunities to really partner uh, with the federal government and with the, the, the suppliers and the, the OEMs to, to make sure that we are uh, really pushing the limits of what we can do with battery electric, what we can do with hydrogen, what we can do with biofuels, because it's, a, it, it's not a just pick one path right now and go forward. We need to be exploring all opportunities and the, the pros and cons of each type of, uh, of next-gen fuel or next-gen power source. And so that's what we're doing. And the, the, the programs that the IJA provided uh, and, and the agencies that it did uh, are, are just getting up and humming. And so we're looking forward to really uh, working with the, the government to, to advance that R&D. Uh, thank you. Mrs. Spear, uh, I was surprised, uh, perhaps I shouldn't have been, to note that um, women make up, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only 7.9% of truck drivers that was in 2021. That was an increase of only 0.1% compared to the year before. How does the trucking industry plan to increase recruitment and training opportunities for women? Great question. <clears throat> Added emphasis across all of our member companies uh, has to change and shift toward different pools of talent. We talked just recently about the 18 to 20, veteran service members uh, exiting. We also need to, to really make an emphasis on urban hiring and gender. And with respect to women drivers, you gotta sit down and listen to them. You gotta begin to understand what it 
what, what are the headwinds? What are the reasons and concerns that they have about joining our industry? Talk to the ones that are out there among the 7%. And what are their concerns? You're gonna find that uh, within training, those programs need to improve. There needs to be more women and women trainers. Um, and, and, and that's essential that those programs be adjusted and understand the concerns that women have about becoming a truck driver. Uh, but you also have drivers that will say when they're out on the road, their concerns for getting out of the truck at night, not having well-lit, secure parking. And it's an inhibitor. It's a deterrent from someone, you know, entering a good-paying job with, with exceptional benefits. Uh, we want to grow this populace. I was just in Europe and found out that their percentage is actually 3%. I, I thought seven was, was, was bad. So we really need to have better training. We need to m look at ways that we can improve safety and security and alleviate those concerns that women, women feel safe in this industry. And uh, they are a major contributor. It is a pool of talent that we believe could really shore up our shortage. We're short 78,000 drivers. I would love all 78,000. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Perry for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for making the trip and being here. Mr. Spear, since we're on the discussion, not where I wanted to go, but I think it's important to recognize that, that truck drivers, whether you're a man or a woman, need to be able to protect yourself in an increasingly violent society and the inability to, to carry a firearm across state lines in many cases because of the, ultra, the, the, the restrictions uh, in, in various states makes that uh, an impossibility to, and to stay legal. So something that you might want to consider taking up in all the things that you're doing to uh, protect your drivers and keep them safe. But I'd like to talk to you about the independent contractor business model in our nation and how important it is to the trucking industry, the supply chain, and to people's freedom and ability to get into a business and make, make good decisions for themselves and for their family and to note that the administration, in particular, people on the left and states, are assaulting this uh, this model of making a living and 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 in your industry, the front line in this war is California, of course, where AB5 effectively outlawed owner-operated model model uh, by reforming the uh, restating the term employee. I just wonder if you could characterize as, as with as much cargo comes into California and has to be shipped across the country, how AB5 has affected the industry and the supply chain from your viewpoint. Well, independent contractors, have, have, that model has been in existence for over 90 years. And it is the spirit of being a small business person. A lot of our largest members started with one truck as independent contractors. Now they employ thousands of people. So giving people the right to choose that path, that's what's in question here with AB5 and the Department of Labor NPRM that's currently pending. And I would just say that, that uh, stop talking to, to um, the media and start talking to the independent contractors. I can bring sc scores of them up here and they'll tell you exactly why they choose this path. They want seasonal work, they want part-time work, they have another business on the side. Whatever the reason may be, that is their decision. That's their choice. And saying that an employer is forcing them into this category because they don't want to pay them more or they don't want to pay health benefits, the independent contractors will tell you that that is not the case. Now, I'm not saying in any employment category there isn't some instance out there of abuse. But to reform the entire state law or the national law based on, you know, an anecdote, just talk to the independent contractors. They'll tell you this, this is a wonderful profession. This is a business that they want to grow. They want to add trucks, drivers underneath them, serving other companies. Give them that option. Don't take it away. We're short 78,000 drivers. You take away our independent contractors, you're going to pay more for everything we eat, drink, and wear. I think inflation's bad now. It makes it only worse. Sir, so everybody in the room knows, even though we're not sometimes willing to talk about it, what this is about. It's not about profits. It's about unionized labor and forcing that on people. Um, and you already 
mentioned the hour and wage division of the U.S. Department of Labor's notice of proposed rulemaking in that regard. But what I'm looking for in the last minute and a half or less that we have, what has been the impact to the supply chain that if you can, if you can contextualize that in California and across the country and what will be the impact if it's allowed through the NPRM to go across the country, what will be the impact to, to, to consumers, to people that want to be in the business and to citizens across the country? Any state like California that adopts AB5 uh, as a model, you're going to have an inability to move freight from those ports to the rest of the country. I have companies that are simply dependent on this model cannot operate, cannot comply with the rules of AB5, the, the added layers for testing who is and isn't an independent contractor, they're gonna pull out. They're just simply not gonna operate in California. And that's unacceptable, not just for the people that live in California, but throughout the rest of the country. I can't put everything on rail. I mean, we have to work together, ends right. But that stuff's gonna have to move out of those ports by truck, by and large, those companies aren't gonna operate there. That's the impact on the supply chain. You're gonna pay more, you're gonna have less options. I think consumers, constituents, are gonna find that unacceptable. And you're right, by the way, there is no enforcement mechanism in California for this. It's done by the plaintiff's bar, that's by design. They're gonna litigate us, and then the unions are gonna come in and try to organize them. That's what's behind this. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now uh, recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jeffries, it's on. Can you hear? Okay. The infrastructure law provided 3.7 billion for much needed grade separation project. Now we need to construct these projects to relieve congestion, improve safety, air quality, and freight movement in the communities such as mine. How and when will the railroads work with local communities and state transportation agencies to ensure these projects get built quickly? Are railroads willing to boost, remove red tape and invest in these projects? Well, that's a great question. And we are 100% willing to remove red tape to get projects done. Um, we, we, we often need a partner in, in the, the state and federal government to do that as well. But you're, you're spot on. The, the 3.7 billion uh, for, for grade crossing safety, grade separations was probably the, 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 the most dynamic, exciting piece of that vast legislation for our particular industry. And we look forward, I believe we're expecting the, the first round of, uh, of uh, uh, the NOFA to, to come available here in the, in, the, in the near future. And I know my railroads are excited about the opportunities there. And you're right, we've got to pick the most high impact projects. We've got to collaborate with communities to make sure that we're being good partners. We do have a track record there. We've got models around the country of working with states and localities to get projects done. And this is a really, really transformational opportunity to, for, for pedestrian safety, for quality of life, for freight fluidity, for emissions reductions. So we're absolutely ready, willing, able to work to, to put these dollars to work. Well, should could approved uh, some of those on the Alameda Corridor East. We have some projects that the railroads gave zero on projects. Uh, Mr. Spear, I'm very concerned by the increasing number of reports of new female truck drivers being sexually assaulted during training rides. Stories are often the same. New truck drivers required to take a training ride with experienced truck driver and then sexually harassed or assaulted during the ride. Often occurs in isolated areas and results in training being left on the side of the road. What is the trucking industry doing to address this situation? Great question, Congresswoman. Zero tolerance, zero. It's unacceptable to have that happen in any industry, but specifically to trucking. Just with Congressman Norton, I'd love to have all 78,000 vacancies filled by women drivers. To do that, our members, our industry have to have not just programs that train to this, of why that's unacceptable. They actually have to enforce it to ensure that it doesn't happen. At ATA, we are very active with truckers against trafficking, working with our driver populace to train them to spot the trafficking of women and children for sexual exploitation. That there sets the bar, that that behavior is unacceptable. We train drivers to look for it internally within the company. 
we have to go further. We just launched last year the Women in Motion program to really focus on training programs that, that overcome this, this instance and having women train women drivers is certainly a good step forward. These programs have to speak to that. Well, I certainly would like to see some of those programs uh, carried through, sir. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Reagan, I recently visited bus drivers in my district in El Monte bus station. They were very pleased with our work in the infrastructure lot to improve driver bus safety. They informed me of more, the need of more and bigger shields to c protect them. We must continue to hold FCA and transit agencies accountable for these bus safety improvements. Bus drivers also mentioned that many drivers are reaching retirement. And there needs to be improvement, improved recruitment and training on the jobs. Can you please comment on both of the needs for bus safety and these bus driver recruitment? Yes, thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Um, the, and thank you for your help in getting that work driver safety provision included in the IIJA. That was a vital uh, piece of legislation. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little frustrated by the pace with which that, that's being implemented. I'd like to see us moving a little bit further along, a little bit faster in terms of protecting these workers. Um, simply because it's, it's horrific what they have to deal with and the number of stories I see of somebody being attacked. But also, I think that's a, a direct impact on your second part of the question, which is on recruitment. We do need to recruit a whole lot more people into this industry. It starts with making them good jobs, which I think in, in most systems, these are gonna be good paying jobs with good benefits. Um, but if the best advertisement for your industry is the local news story about another driver being assaulted, and that's not a very good advertisement about bringing people into your industry. So we need to address this right now, and I think shields are a good start, but also bringing workers into the planning and training and, um, and the safety planning committees is a critical part. Thank you, Mr. Chair. General ladies, time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, really appreciate all these <clears throat> good witnesses that are here today. Um, I proudly represent the 36th district of, of um, the state of Texas and uh, home of, of our great Port of Houston. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Gother. We really appreciate it. I'm gonna get to a question to you here in just a little bit. As you all know, some of you mentioned in your testimonies, government investment is absolutely vital uh, to our transportation and infrastructure industry. And that said, we all also know that just throwing money at a problem doesn't make it go away. Unfortunately, the federal government proved that once again uh, with last uh, session's uh, Democrat bill, the $1.2 trillion bill that is directly, I think without question, contributed to the current economic crisis that we find ourselves in. I hope that some lessons were learned. Throwing billions of taxpayer dollars at this industry without prioritizing supply chain solutions, pandemic recovery issues like fraud and abuse serious workforce issues, overly burdensome red tape, and other underlying issues will not actually allow us to see long-term sustainable improvement and investment in our nation's infrastructure. And as some of you noted, it will lead to industry-specific inflation, increasing the costs that are unique to, to our sector. On top of that, carving out political handouts for niche green transportation and infrastructure projects and companies is not good for the industry as a whole. In fact, it causes delays, increased costs, and is anti-competitive and all around counterproductive. I'm very deeply concerned about the left's rampant spending and impact it's having on inflation and our economic stability as we face a $31.4 trillion national debt now. Quickly, Mr. Firth, uh, are AGC members hurting due to higher costs, timber, transportation equipment, and things like that? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes, are your, are, are, are your uh, general contracting members hurting due to higher costs? Are higher costs hurting your members? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You know, I mean, uh, look anywhere you want, uh, you know, fuel is a big one. Um, you know, just internally in our own company this last year, our fuel bill, we were close to over a million dollars over budget on fuel. Absolutely. Um, it, our, our workers have to drive further, you know, as we're in rural areas, um, it costs more money. So fuel is just one that comes to my mind. Thank you. Mr. Jeffries, are AAR members hurting from higher costs, constructing Ab new facilities, labor, maintenance, et cetera? 
Absolutely. Inflation affects not only the, the goods and materials we use to operate, it also affects the, the customers that, uh, whose goods we move. So it, it's hit on multiple layers. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Spears, are ATA members hurting from higher costs? Fuel, labor, sky high, new truck prices, batteries, et cetera? All of the above. You know, the price of fuel is still a, a huge headwind, especially for the smaller companies, owner operators. Right. It's a serious matter. Thank you. Now, Mr. Gunther, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, as the proud representative of the Port of Houston, I have a question for you regarding the port's underfunding issue, which you mentioned in your opening statement. I'm very uh, personally very familiar with the operations and maintenance funding challenges that our port has faced for many years. But would you quickly elaborate on the Houston Ship Channel specific needs for additional investment there? You 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 mentioned that in your opening statement. Uh, yes, thank you, Congressman Babin. The um, you know the reality is you mentioned throwing money at a problem. Yeah, we've got a short term. We're about to be draft restricted. A quick fix might say throw money at the problem, but what really needs to happen in reality is annual maintenance, deliberate. Uh, robust and decisions to make sure that we are providing the funding for those waterways in the United States uh, in the United States uh, that that you know have the most economic benefit and make sure they're not um, deficient or limited. You know, as I mentioned, you know, we we the largest port in the country in terms of tonnage and number of vessel calls on a per ton basis are getting less of uh, funding for operating and maintenance, which makes our channels, uh, our Houston ship channel become more limited. And at the end, when ships are drawing less water and able to haul less freight, uh, it's gonna cost more money. And we have to be prepared for those ships and making future investments. We're, we're building our channel now uh, deepening and widening our channel now to handle those ships that can come through the Panama Canal, the new Panama Canal. Yes, sir, exactly. I see that my time is up, so I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Chairman Graves for calling this hearing. The implementation of the IIJA is of critical importance to this nation. The bill itself will, could, properly implemented, really lay the foundation for America's economic future. All the pieces of it, whether it's dredging or highways or railroads, also the grid system and the like, critically important. I want to focus on two issues. Uh, first of all, Mr. Reagan, if you could respond to the AB5 issue quickly. Yeah, I would, uh, thank you for that. I, first of all, the, the, the language, what, what AB5 does is simply cl provide clear demonstrate or clear definition for what is an employee, what is not. It does not eliminate the independent contractor method because there are plenty of ways for someone to do outside work and clearly demonstrate their independent contractors, nor does it require them to be in a union. In fact, all it does is properly classify workers so that they, ha they have the constitutionally guaranteed ability to join a union should they choose to do so. Thank you. Well, there'll be much more discussion about this. This is an ongoing discussion in California about the implementation and possible modification of it along the way. Thank you. Um, I want to really uh, deal with an issue that was raised by Mr. Firth and uh, also you, Mr. Reagan, uh, and that deals with the uh, 1.2 trillion. Who's it to benefit? Uh, the construction industry, the transportation industry, or all of America's new existing and potential industries? This is the Buy America provision. We spent a lot of time in this committee uh, working on that, uh, not only here in this house, but also in the other house. And uh, we have put in place the Buy America provisions uh, that are much more broad than they were before the IIJA and other legislation went into effect. So what I want to really get to, Mr. Reagan, uh, if you could deal with this, is how the ancient 1983 broad waiver, which still exists uh, in the Department of Transportation, how it conflicts with the law that we have passed, that is the Buy America provisions. Yeah, it, it, it addresses the waiver is on manufactured goods, so it goes beyond you know iron and steel, um, and that should be repealed, because if we truly do want to use this type of investment to rebuild our manufacturing capability in this country, we need to have an expansive Buy America uh, protections across, across the board. 
But we also need to have expectations within the industry uh, to know what is going to be required to be made here. And I think we need to have those definitions put in place very soon. It, so far, um, you know, we're still lagging behind and I totally understand that it is a complicated process. It was a big expansion of the program, but we do need to put very clear definitions and timelines in place so the industries have an opportunity to respond and start reshoring some of that work. Uh, I want to be very, very clear here. The 1983 waiver is a broad waiver. It basically says, uh, with very few exceptions, everything can be waived. It's in direct conflict with the law that we passed. Uh, and uh, while Mr. Firth correctly raised the issue, uh, it's complicated. There are many different pieces to any construction project. Uh, however, that waiver it should be repealed, and then we should get about, simultaneously get about further definitions and clarification. And so, in the, Mr. Firth, if you'd like to deal with the clarifications and uh, along the line, give you 30 seconds, we'll come back at other issues here. Uh, well, thank you for the question. It's confusing. Um, <laughs> Indeed it, it is. It really is. I mean, I don't know if, if as a company, uh, am I going to have to hire somebody to really sort this out as a, you know, what the rule really means. Um, you know, from a construction standpoint, I guess we believe that when we go to build something, by America, it should already be, or if it's a material or some type of gadget or whatever that we're supposed to implement into a project, it should already be spelled out for us, very clear. Um, and I guess that's where the confusion is, because is we never know until it seems like at the very end uh, where it isn't. And then trying to find an equivalent to even get a waiver uh, is, is very difficult. Good. Um, Department of Transportation, you must be here in the room. Be prepared to be banged on here until you get this squared away. Repeal the 83 law and get about simultaneously the clarification that's necessary to implement the law that we wrote last year. Uh, with regard to one other issue uh, in 18 seconds, uh, Trustee Johnson, uh, Mr. Johnson has uh, stepped out of the room, but the uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act is in place. I understand he's going to pick up this issue and ask those of you that are at the ports railroads and uh, others about that law. And it was a nice bipartisan bill. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Rouser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank our uh, panelists for being here today. Really appreciate uh, the value of your, uh, of your input. Uh, so we often talk about uh, the ramifications of, uh, of COVID and mandatory shutdown of the economy and all the supply chain disruptions. <laughs> Uh, but just for the sake of um, uh, educational purposes, I want to go back uh, pre-COVID, uh, before COVID, uh, when the economy was hum humming along pretty good, uh, gas prices were pretty low, uh, respectively. Uh, what were your biggest supply chain challenges then? Uh, if we could go, uh, starting with Mr. Spear, all the way down. I think our leading, leading headwind um, is the shortage of talent. It was before COVID, we were roughly 50, 51,000 short on drivers, about 29, 30,000 short on technicians. That inflated to 81,000. It's starting to tick down a little bit. We're at 78,000 on drivers. Um, you know, I'd say for all the other sectors of employment out there that are now post-COVID facing the same problem that we had before COVID, welcome to the show. I mean, we really are stretched thin in terms of what we can do without people hard-working men and women getting behind the wheel to move the freight. So we're moving 72.5% of the domestic freight in this country. To grow that, you're going to have to put more people behind the wheel. So it's, it's going to continue to be a real issue for us. Mr. Jeffries? I think it's the ability to, to put dollars to work on projects and do it in a reasonable amount of time in order to not only maintain and replace what might be um, older equipment, bridges, et cetera, or expanding into new facilities, new yards, um, really just incredibly long timelines for review, a lot of uncertainty there. So lack of certainty and lack of timeliness of being able to put our dollars to work to maintain and grow capacity. Uh, Mr. Firth? Uh, for us, it's probably gonna be steel. Uh, you know, whether it be rebar for, for the bridges that we work on or anything like that, um, you know, hitting rolling dates from the mills or whatnot, uh, takes a little bit of logistics to make sure that you get your order in ahead of time. Mr. Gunther? Uh, for ports, uh, our port and most sea ports, I would say it's just, you know, the, the, the supply chain is very 
asset base with, you know, from ships to ports to trucks to chassis to where they end up at a warehouse or vice versa. And, uh, you know, when one link in that supply chain backs up, for us as seaports, it caused a lot of congestion on our ports and it, with the inability to move them out quickly. Ports can't be storage facilities. They have to be transit facilities in order. And, and you saw ships backing up uh, in Houston and East Coast and, and across the country. So um, uh, just measures um, and that, that may be more fluid uh, to move cargo through ports. And you will have to continue to look at that, making investments in, in opportunities to get cargo out of our ports. Mr. Regan. Thank you. Um, honestly, it was insufficient workforce levels at Class One railroads. Um, it's a problem that continues today, and I appreciate the comments from uh, from my friend Ian about what they're doing to address it. But that was a problem before the pandemic and continued throughout. Yeah, uh, Mr. Jeffries, uh, going back to you, what are some uh, current or proposed regulations being discussed that could negatively impact uh, freight railroads' ability to respond to significant supply chain bottlenecks? And then. Follow up to that, are there any deregulatory actions that need to be taken to help address the matter? Well, to, to pair up my friend Chris, how long do we have? Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep it short. So a, a couple of different things, and it's different parts of government. I talked about the ability to put dollars to work. So, so there are opportunities to, to build on the success of a IJA when it came to one federal decision uh, to expand that beyond DOT-led projects. Uh, there are other opportunities to limit timelines and scope for other reviews uh, through different agencies. Uh, when it comes to our, our regulator uh, at the FRA, as I said, deployment of technology is not only the, the next leap forward in safety, it's also the next leap forward in efficiency and uh, in increasing the ability to move more goods on what is a limited physical infrastructure. And we need a partner there. We need a partner that's going to to, to work with us to build objective data sets in order to demonstrate that uh, a new tool is, is, is uh, resulting in a higher level of safety uh, and allow that to be folded into uh, to the regulatory structure. So I wouldn't even say deregulatory, I'd say regulatory modernization. Um, our economic radar regulator, the STB, is considering some rules that would increase the amount of touches, increase the amount of switches into the freight rail network. And that's the last thing you want to do. You want to go in the opposite direction for fluidity, uh, reducing employee risk, is getting switches out of the network and allowing goods to move end to end with as few touches as possible. I'm happy to get into that further, but uh, just a few quick points there. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Carson. Thank you. Uh, congratulations to Chairman Grays and Ranking Member Larson. Um, for the panelists, uh, what, what is the most important thing in your mind? Uh, I know we have a committee agenda, but in your mind, uh, we should work on this year, and why is that your priority, and what specific changes should be made? Well, I think oversight, this being the first hearing to really look at a $1.2 trillion bill first year in implementation is a really good start. I think we all have a vested bipartisan interest in having a, a solid supply chain that isn't contracting in, in various points. And when it does, to collectively you know, look at the problem and come up with real solutions. And I think we've demonstrated an ability, government and private sector, to do just that. I thought the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, the CHIPS Act, Bringing back, you know, those sensitive items so that we can manufacture them here uh, ensures that we're going to have the capability to serve this economy long term. Uh, if there's anything that came out of COVID, it's it's really shining a spotlight on the weaknesses. I think the IIJA it, uh, does a lot of potentially good things to solve that. Oversight of this law, not just this year, but in the coming four years, is going to be really, really important. I would certainly echo that. You know, the, where, wherever you are on whether you supported or, or didn't support the IAJA, there's there's an, init, an, an, an immense opportunity uh, to to put a lot of dollars to to good projects. And so, the, I would say the hard part starts now: is how how do the agencies get that money out in a merit-based, transparent, objective manner to make sure that the impact of such projects is maximized 
and how do you put that money to work as quickly and expeditiously as possible? This committee can really lead that charge at a bi in a bipartisan way. I think we're all excited to hear the, the tone coming out of the, the heads of the committee here. And you look around the room and you see all the, the prior leaders of this committee, all of them now. Um, there's a lot of folks from different walks of life, different backgrounds, but I think getting back to the tradition of accomplishment and getting things done together will be key and allow this committee to be remarkably successful in supporting uh, the projects that I've mentioned. No doubt. I think for us from the contracting community, it would be uh, streamlining the, the permitting process. You know, as, as we get uh, all the work from the designers and the owners and everything like that, uh, concurrent reviews, something that can speed up the process to get the projects out the door. I mean, the projects all start with permits, and for us, that's where our biggest bottleneck is. I just further to what I've talked about before, I, you know, with um, from the IIJA just staying on point with the operator maintenance, talked a lot about channels, but also with highway infrastructure. It's land side, water side, efficient movement of freight and making those continued investments to make sure that the infrastructure side of the supply chain uh, stays adequate. Uh, I think it's pairing the investments that are being made with really strong workforce development and training uh, programs as well to ensure that not only uh, are we building our human infrastructure as we're building our modern transportation infrastructure, but more importantly, that once we have, once we're able to deliver on expanded services, new routes, things like that, that we have the workforce there ready and able to deliver the service that the people expect. Thank you. I yield back, Chairman. Mr. Boss. Thank you, Chairman, and I want to thank the panel for being here. Uh, and Mr. Spears, you know, the trucking industry uh, has recognized that dif dif it's difficult finding safe parking, and, and you've elaborated a little bit on that. Uh, and it's a major challenge for professional drivers due to the lack of capacity. The, your research and the Institute has established drivers spend about 56 minutes per each day searching for a place to be safe and park their vehicle. Now, this is clearly a major inefficiency in our supply chain. However, the problem can be fixed, and I thought we were going to get it done last year. This committee unanimously passed a par truck parking bill out of this committee. It got to the floor, but didn't get anywhere from there. Have you ever seen any issue that is such a time when we have a fix, we know what we need to do, we pass it, we can't get it through in a time whenever we really need to get something done. And I've been around government a long time, but watching something that is so much agreed on and then stalled, I'm just gonna ask you, have you seen anything that's to that level? <laughs> I have actually, yeah. but- uh, Yeah, me too. Let's, let's focus on this issue, and first of all, thank you, and to the entire committee for the support. This is not a partisan issue. No. And anybody can drive out of the Beltway here, and you will see trucks on, on, and off ramps resting. Why? Because they're required by federal law to take breaks. And when those breaks come up and they don't have a place to park, they're going to look for the next best thing. So this is a safety issue, not just to our drivers, men and women. It's also a safety issue for the motoring public. Right. I'm out there driving my car, my family, my kids. You know, I don't want to tangle with our members. I don't think anybody else does either. Getting them safe, secure, well-lit parking is a no-brainer. That's why then Chairman DeFazio had a billion dollars in his bill. Didn't go anywhere. Your bill, I hope, bipartisan, start early. We're going to be out there pounding marble. Thank We're going to be knocking on doors to make certain this gets done. This is a necessity. And by the way, we've been really working hand in glove with the Secretary of Transportation and his team to tap into those discretionary monies that he has under the IIJA to ensure that blocks that and states have access to it for truck parking. So in the interim, while that legislation moves, we're gonna be working with them to ensure that we're tackling the problem as well. I haven't confronted anybody on this issue that disagrees. And by the way, we sent that letter up. That's a joint letter between ATA and OOIDA. That makes a statement. We are in this together. This is an issue that impacts whether you are an owner operator, an IC, a full fleet. We all need more safe parking. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and my next question, I wanna go this route. 
and you know that I was born and raised in the trucking industry. Um, I like to tell people I came home from the Marine Corps, ran the business for 10 years, loved it for eight. Um, so, but I need, I need you to expand if you can. Now this is a state issue, but, but I wanna bring it up here. My brother works tirelessly to get drivers. He gets the drivers, gets them qualified, makes sure he wants to have them, and then because of state law now that has legalized marijuana, they can't pass the drug tests. And it's happening all over this nation, and if this committee needs to know exactly how much that is affecting the trucking industry, and can you expand on that? As you know, the secretary asked me what keeps me up at night, this issue. Someone who is impaired getting behind the wheel of an 80,000 pound vehicle. And you got multiple states, over a dozen now, plus Canada, legalizing recreational marijuana. It's widespread. We're regulated by the federal government. We cannot have anyone impaired using marijuana or any other narcotic operating this equipment. So this channel conflict between the federal rules and the states allowing it, this ambiguity is creating a litigious environment and we're caught right in the middle of it. Somebody's gotta step up to the plate and put safety first. You wanna smoke weed at home? Smoke weed at home. If it's legal, fine. Do not get behind the wheel of an 80,000 pound vehicle. We need to have strong standards and we need to enforce the law. And it's tough to say that because we're short 78,000 drivers. I, mean, I want more of them coming in, but not if they're impaired. Can't afford that to happen. You hit a, a school bus full of kids and they're impaired, that's on us. We gotta do better than that. So this is an issue that I pose to you all, we have got to work on. Thank you, my time's expired and I yield back. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the things that I think is a real asset to this bill we've been discussing this morning is that it pairs investment in workforce development with investment in sustainable fuels, green energy, uh, environmental concerns. And I see that in Nevada, we've already got almost $9 million through our RTC to buy um, electric buses. So Mr. Regan, could you talk about how that combination of workforce development and good energy policy through transit could be used in other government agencies? Yeah, thank you so much for that question because I think one of the really uh, great developments that's come out of the implementation of this law was with the low and no emission bus program, mm -hmm. uh, where 5% of that money is required to go towards workforce development. That's critical because, as I said before, making sure that we have the workforce ready and trained once these buses become available. But also, we're, we're making a pretty, it, it's bigger transition than you might expect to change from a diesel uh, bus to an electric bus. You do have to have specific requirements from a maintenance side and an operation side to make sure that we are fully prepared to deploy them into our communities. I think that's exactly the type of model that needs to be used in other programs in infrastructure because for too long we have focused on the new shiny equipment or the new shiny bridge without focusing on the people that are gonna be critical to operating it, building it, maintaining it. Thank you, I, I agree with that. I, uh, in addition to buses, we've been hearing a lot about uh, two-man crews on railroads and we'll hear about the, oh, the, how the trains have, uh, there are so many fewer now than there used to be, so many fewer people working than there used to be, so many stock buybacks as opposed to supporting a workforce. Uh, isn't that kind of part of the problem with the supply chain? Is the lack of personnel or qualified personnel or personnel that's uh, stoned, as we heard, on trucks and that sort of thing. Could you describe that a little bit for us? Yeah, I think there's a direct correlation between the workforce reductions that we saw in rail and the disruptions in service that we saw uh, pretty severely over the last few years. And that's been pointed to by the customers from the railroads as well. If you go to the, the Surface Transportation Board hearings, um, you know, a lot of trade associations from agriculture, from energy, from chemical companies pointed to the insufficient workforce numbers as the number one cause for why there were delays and why they couldn't move their goods to market. Uh, so I, I do think that's a really pressing issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and when it comes to a two-person crew, you know, we support the federal rulemaking that's under, underway right now. Uh, we're glad to see that this is being treated as a safety issue, which to us it truly is. If you ask any one of our members who operate a train, 
The crew size is a vital safety issue to making sure that they can operate these upwards of three mile long trains that go through every community in this country in a very safe manner. Well, thank you. Now you yield back. Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my comments, questions today are primarily for Mr. Spear, Mr. Gunther. Uh, speak a little bit about trucking, uh, some of the issues related specifically. Sorry, it's hard to see you around uh, Mr. Owen's head right here. He's, you know, he's a big guy. I can barely see you over there. Thanks, Burgess. I appreciate it. Uh, so talk about a couple of things on this. We identify it as an issue in this way. When you're looking at goods coming into port, and uh, uh, by the way, I'll pause and say I was glad to hear you talk about the, the 80,000 driver shortage. Not that I'm glad that exists, but I was glad to hear you speak about it. So we look at goods coming into port and say if those goods were taken out of port in uh, some of these states, they could go from the place they were dropped off to somewhere else in the state, and you could have a, a, a CDL driver between the ages of, of 18 and 20. They, in some states, don't have to hit that 21-year-old threshold. Uh, but you can't have somebody take the goods out of port and then take them to somewhere else in the state if they don't reach that 21-year-old age threshold because of the interstate commerce that that, that is associated with. So I, I certainly don't look at this as an issue that solves by any means uh, everything that's going on with, with trucker and, and driver shortage. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that specifically as a lane, uh, adjusting the age for bringing goods out of port to other places in the state for CDL drivers between the age of 18 and 21 to add a little bit to that workforce. Would love to hear your guys' comments on that. Uh, uh, go ahead, please. No, no, no please. So uh, thank you for that question, Congressman Mask. You know, as, as one of the largest container ports in the country and one that is served primarily by truckers, you know, we certainly, uh, you know, 99% of the volume that comes through our port is by truckers. Yeah, we, we, uh, uh, you know, live by the fact that we think truckers have a right to make a good living. So uh, increasing the availability that we saw, in availability that we saw to the pandemic, I think certainly adds to, and it's a good thing for moving cargo and commerce. We'd certainly uh, support that. And, but somebody said earlier, you know, as long as they were certified and trained and doing whatever, that, which I'm sure they would be, I think it would be uh, any, any uh, additional trucking workforce, uh, moving goods to and from our port would be uh, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Spear. Yeah, I, just, I think the key word there is training. From our perspective, making certain that that block of talent can safely and responsibly operate the equipment, whether it's across state lines or not. We would want that in any of the 49 states. That was the beauty of the Drive Safe Act. I think you're working on legislation that, that is really intended to tap into this talent pool. And we have an aging workforce higher than the national average. As they exit, if we do not replace you know, those, those drivers, that 78,000 is gonna to increase to 150,000 over the next eight to 10 years. And that's unacceptable. Our ability to service this economy uh, is gonna be inhibited if we don't bring in new talent. So training them, leveraging technology, uh, ensuring that they have the ability to competently operate this equipment and grow in our industry. It, the pay is remarkable. It's averaging around $70,000 with full benefits without a college degree and all the debt that comes with it. So we believe that this is a viable workforce uh, of the future uh, if we can tap into that and compete. No differently than our military. And we train 18 to 20 year olds to do the unthinkable. Hopefully they don't have to. I think we can teach young people, you know, how to operate this equipment safely. Yeah, Mr. Spear, let's make one other, uh, I'll make one other quick comment on this uh, just reflectively. And if you have a response, by all means, uh, give it. But you know, we're the, we're the tradesman committee. I mean, we deal with building things vertically, horizontally, tradesmen of all kinds. If somebody were to get into, you know, one of those, one of those trade programs to be a journeyman for, for XYZ uh, coming right out of high school, fact of the matter is it's less likely that that's gonna be their pursuit is uh, into to trucking and, and moving our goods. But if somebody has that same availability at the same level uh, at that age, then you're probably gonna to get to capture more individuals instead of them moving to one of the other journeyman professions, hypothetically? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that the apprenticeship program, the national apprenticeship program um, that uh, was put forth by the Biden administration, we worked for four years with the Trump administration to produce this product. We finally got it done. This is the gold standard of training. Any company, any member of ours that uh, amplifies apprenticeship programs that are nationally registered, uh, that is the gold standard. It shows that that employer really is focused on training, giving that employee the skill sets that they're going to need to be successful long term. So I, I think replicating that is a no-brainer, and we're really, really pleased to have that National Register Apprenticeship Program up and running. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mass. Uh, Ms. Wilson, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Graves and Ranking Member Larson for holding today's hearing. As founder and chair of the Florida Ports Caucus, the state of our nation's infrastructure and supply chain have long been upon, among my top priorities because of their impact on jobs. As a newly elected Congresswoman in 2011, I created a door sign that read, Today marks in the number of days without the passage of a jobs bill. It took 3,970 days or more than 10 years, but finally, under President Biden's leadership, Congress finally passed a landmark bipartisan infrastructure law that supports the level of job creation that I long sought. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, along with the American Rescue Plan and Inflation Reduction Act, delivered the resources to rebuild our infrastructure and address the supply chain crisis. I'm especially proud to have been one of five members selected to co-sponsor this historic infrastructure bill. Consequently, Florida is receiving $18 billion to update our highways, bridges, transit, seaports, and airports. Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Larson, I look forward to working with you on a bipartisan infrastructure legislation. With that, I have a, a few questions. Mr. Reagan, thank you for bringing attention to the bridge improvement projects authorized by the IIJA. In my district, we have Broad Causeway Bridge, which connects mainland Miami-Dade to various cities on the beaches. The Broad Causeway is looking to use that funding to update the bridge and increase its accessibility. Can you explain how discretionary grant funding has benefited the men and women of the TTD? Yes, thank you for that question. <clears throat> uh, the grant programs, and we're starting to see the money really flow now, are just critical towards advancing, the, especially the building and construction trades that I uh, represent. But the bridge programs in particular, you look at the number of structurally deficient bridges around this country uh, that have been highlighted by the American Society of Civil Engineers. I mean, we need, this is a, it's an epidemic in this country that we have so many bridges that are not safe to drive on right now. And getting this money out quickly and getting it with expert um, you know, union workforce operating on these bridges is gonna be critical to making sure that we have both a, a more efficient, but also uh, a safer system in this country. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Firth, you stated in your testimony that without the IIJA states would have to cut roughly 20 to 30 percent of their projects. Can you provide examples of the projects that you were able to complete because of the IIJA grant programs? Uh, we're, we haven't had any IIJA projects yet. Uh, we anticipate, though, here in 2023 that uh, that they'll be coming out, so I don't have any examples for you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Spear, in your testimony, you mentioned years of infrastructure neglect. Can you highlight how the IIJA has improved working conditions for drivers? Well, I think, as I mentioned, uh, congestion is a significant concern, not only in terms of the $75 billion that we lose just sitting idle, the amount of time a driver spends sitting idle, that's a lot of time to think about maybe doing something different with their life. Okay, moving goods from A to B efficiently is good. It burns less fuel, it's less emissions, it gets the product where it needs to be. That means we also pay less for it. 
So inflation goes down. But the impact that it has on the driver, I can't think of anything worse, maybe even the dentist, that I would rather not do than sit in traffic. And 425,000 drivers sitting idle for an entire year, that's unacceptable. So the IIJ has the potential to really target those top 100 bottlenecks and find ways to alleviate that, get the trucks moving. Whether there's more lanes, but get the cars and trucks moving, that's, that's gonna be a huge factor. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Burchett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some very hard-hitting questions on COVID, but I realized I'm not in the oversight committee right now, so when I get to oversight, I will ask some hard-hitting transportation questions, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to thank you all. And I always wonder why we always thank you all for holding these meetings when it's your dadgum job to hold these meetings. I, I don't understand that. Maybe I'm, that's probably why I'm not at the schmooze level that some of these other guys are. But anyway, take note. Uh, Mr. Firth, I was, you stated that federal agencies under the Biden administration are systematically reversing streamlining reforms to the National Environmental Policy Act. And you're introducing, um, and introducing additional requirements to delay the infrastructure projects. I'm wondering, do these changes by the administration uh, increase these project costs? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, the longer that the permitting process goes on, it's less projects that are getting out to, to be constructed. You know, I mean, that's where um, different risks, uh, you know, that as a contractor, we have to we have to be thinking about when it comes to uh, the permitting process. You know, projects uh, for me working in the Pacific Northwest, for instance, I'll give you the example uh, fish windows for us. Right. So we have to work from in the water, say, July to October. Right. And these projects are being developed. Um, they're usually having to get out to bid, say, two months before right now, so in the fall. Uh, you know, and if for some reason that permitting process gets missed or whatnot, it might delay the project another year or whatnot. So I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Okay. And I, why do you think these bureaucrats are making it so difficult for working folks to complete these infrastructure projects? Just, just out of meanness or, you know? Justifying their job, I don't know. You tell me, brother. I, I don't have an answer, I guess. <laughs> Are you afraid to answer? Yeah. <laughs> afraid to get a project delayed? Yes. See my buddy Sullivan back there, he's not, he, he's smile, he's not smiling. He's like, oh crap, Burchett, don't say anything else. So, uh, well, could the environmental permitting reform um, speed project delivery or the lower project costs and still protect the environment? I think so. I mean, I think there's a, a, a definitely a opportunity there for concurrent reviews and having, you know, both sides work hand in hand. I mean, um, I guess one thing that I always think about is, is that we need the permits to build the projects, right? So, I mean, in order yeah. to get all this done, um, there's got to be a little bit of give and take. Uh, so, yeah. All right. I'll let you off the hook for a little while. How about thank you, that? Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Spear, you like to talk. I'm going to let you give you an opportunity again. Um, I'm concerned that this administration's EV charging programs could discourage private investment, and it would increase electricity prices for our ratepayers, and it would leave drivers waiting in remote parking lots and rest areas. What's your thoughts on that? I think we need a realistic timeline, and that starts with an honest discussion. I really do. I, th I think that uh, this rush to net zero is missing a lot of key elements that we all need to be talking about. Now, let's just say that we have all the infrastructure across the country to charge. Let's just say right now that it's all in place. Where's the power going to come from that goes into the charging stations? Nobody seems to want to talk about that. We'll consume just our 4% of the vehicles on the road will consume 40%. Tennessee, all power Tennessee to charge. comes from nukes, um, coal power, and, um, and hydroelectric. Wherever. But it's got to happen. Yeah. If you're going to have the power to go into it, if you're going to make us do this, then we're going to have to have the power. But also beyond that, where do the minerals come from for a 5,000-pound battery? Slave labor, mostly. Um, labor. I, I have another question along those lines. I wonder, do um, you feel like, when we did this rush to do this, you know, this government was gonna put all these charging stations. 
And in my area, I worry about the entrepreneurs, the mom and pops who built these truck stops and gas stations and invested their hard-earned dollars. And now yours and my tax dollars are going to put something out on the interstate somewhere that's unsafe, uh, unregulated, and well, overregulated by the government and, uh, and not very well thought of. What do you think? Look, I, th I think that uh, the markets have to dictate this. Markets reflect reality. And these timelines that we're facing don't. And we need an honest discussion about getting there because what's gonna happen when we get to these timelines, like California, 2035, that's 12 years away. It's gonna fail, it's gonna be embarrassing, they're gonna be issuing all these exemptions because they rushed to zero and didn't take into account all these realities. And what I'm saying to you is, we're gonna get there eventually. Let's just be realistic about it. And I think what we're dealing with right now is, is impactful on the supply chain and what we pay, inflation, because we're not gonna be able to deliver the goods our, because our we're time's not up. To do Mr. It. Chairman, I yield back no time. I'd love to yield you another five minutes just for the entertainment value, but yeah. uh, I need to go to Mr. Carbajal. Our, our ratings would go way up. I understand <laughs> now two people are and, watching this. And I, would, and I would object, and I would object. <laughs> I know you would, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Uh, ranking Member, excuse me. Mr. Carbajal, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Correction, I'm sorry, Mr. Carbajal. Mr. Payne is actually next. I thought I was getting ahead. Thank you. So did Mr. Payne. I got, I got worried, worried there for a minute. But um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to um, thank um, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Larson um, for their um, leadership. And um, just a quick note, um, Mr. Spear, Mr. Jeffries, um, I'm glad the point that you made in reference to um, trucking and um, rail working together. I need you to think about this as a relay team as opposed to an adversarial uh, relationship. The rail has the, the baton and they pass the baton to the trucking to get to the finish line. So please let's look at at this and that, in that manner. Um, I appreciate you calling this hearing today so we can examine the challenges facing our transportation network. Last year, the railroad subcommittee held two hearings to examine rail service delivery problems. The Service Transportation Board held an emergency two-day hearing on freight, rail shipping delays and their impacts on Americans. Rail shipping delays over the past years have resulted in shortages in the agriculture and energy sectors. Freight railroads have halted shipments to certain parts of the country because they lack the capacity to provide adequate service. As a result of these problems, the Surface Transportation Board has had to issue emergency service orders and service recovery plans to ensure that freight railroads are serving their customers. Mr. Jeffries, a yes or no, please. Do you feel that the freight railroads have enough workers to handle the current demand for rail shipping? Well, certainly that's been front of mind over the past year, and you're right, we certainly had uh, significant service challenges over portions of the last few years. So is that a yes? I'm, I'm getting to that. <laughs> uh, well, we, that's, we, that's we, really what, you know, the interest of time. That's sure thing. We have been hiring aggressively over the past 18 months, and we continue to hire in certain regions around the country. So we're still leaning into that, and uh, uh, those efforts still continue. Thank you. Um, the Service Transportation Board says that long-haul in, intermodal truck traffic has grown 20% more than rail. Between April and September of 2022, the four big railroads added just 420 total train and engine employees. 420, an increase of less than 1%. Mr. Jeffries, we'll try it again, yes or no. Um, are the railroads scaling back hiring plans due to softening demand? We continue to hire as we stand here today, and that number is actually 9% year over year when it comes to employee increases of T&E. 
So you're saying it's more important than 20? I'm sorry? You're saying it was more than 420? I am saying that. Okay, we'll check that. And with um, the time I have remaining, I'd like to ask Mr. Reagan, who represents these workers, if his members share the assessment of the state of uh, the freight railroad industry, and if not, how do we, how do the men and women working for the freight see the state of their industry? Thank you for the question. I, I think as we saw very clearly last year, uh, the morale among freight rail workers has never been lower, at least in, in, in my experience. They're frustrated, they feel overworked. Um, a lot of the focus on attendance policy and yes, sick leave and other issues, I think are a direct result of the insufficient workforce levels. I think if we are able to deal with some of those uh, and continue to prove on some of the gains that were made in that contract that was resolved, uh, I think that we will start to turn the industry around. And I assure you, nobody wants to see a growing, more robust freight rail industry than the members that I represent. They're proud to be railroaders, and they want to continue to do it, but they need to see a change in the operating uh, mechanisms right now in the operating uh, systems so that they can have a uh, return some degree of quality of life to their, their work. Thank you. And uh, with, with the few seconds that I have left, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm going to continue the effort um, it's good that um, the um, salaries went up um, fivefold, but that was not what the workers were asking for. They were asking for sick time, and that is something that we need to address. Um, it's great that their incomes have gone up, but they were interested in sick time, as probably all of you sitting at that panel have in your capacities, in your, in your positions and um, they deserve it as well. And I'll continue to fight for that. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Garrett Graves, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Um, you know, it's been, it's been interesting. Last Congress, we had uh, the infrastructure bill and, and we spent, uh, gosh, I think 24 hours or so in this committee marking up a bill that with the exception of a handful of provisions was largely ignored and, and a Senate bill uh, became law. There's no question we have a supply chain problem. There's no question we have a labor shortage. There's no question that we have inflation issues. There's no question that what's happening with energy prices is having a profound impact on, on your industry, on the ability to, uh, to, to, to carry out logistics around the United States and around the world. Um, but when I look at legislation like the IIJA, the infrastructure bill that, that became law uh, last Congress, I look at things like mandates on, on trying to transition us to electric vehicles. I look at simple math problems where you literally could not produce enough minerals to uh, develop the battery storage or the electric engines or other things that are required under the bill. And then I look at, at the problem we're having in supply chain right now where we're not investing in roads because funds have been diverted to EV charging stations or other things. And, and it, 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 the reality is, is that the legislation has exacerbated the problem that you're already experiencing in your industry, trying to get goods around the United States and around the world. And, and so one of the things that, and, and I know the chairman shares, shares my concern, is that we are going to be looking at kind of how to recalibrate that bill and reprioritize the dollars in places where they're actually needed to complement your efforts to address supply chain issues and, again, try to address the worker shortage and other challenges that we have. Um, I, I, I want to, I'm going to take the conversation a little different. Um, you know, one of the things that I think lessons we've learned from, from what's happened with energy over the past couple of years. We've, we've, we've moved in a direction first that made us more dependent upon Russia for, for oil, and that hasn't worked out so well. Now looking at, at where we're being forced in a renewable energy direction, and I wanna be crystal clear, I support renewable energy technologies, I support reducing emissions, but I also support doing it in a way that makes sense. Um, and, and what we're doing right now is we're forcing greater dependence upon countries like China. Um, and, and I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on, on how we should be looking at this a little bit differently. For example, looking at NATO or NATO Plus as more than just a military organization, looking at it like a supply chain and an economic alliance as well. And that way we have more secure, more allied resources uh, that we're dependent upon. And we're not subjecting ourselves to the volatility of some of these countries that we're not friends with and are simply gonna use uh, their resources as leverage as we 
we've seen China do with some of the critical mineral markets they've cornered around the world, including processing and refining of those minerals. Anyone? I think sourcing is key. Uh, if you're going to build out uh, a transition to an alternative source of energy, say electric, uh, it's, those batteries are going to have to have the minerals. Uh, it's not coming from China. It's not going to come from Congo. So where are we going to get them? Uh, it's going to have to come from here in North America. So these are key questions, and they take time to develop, not just 12 years, but beyond. And we're fine in transitioning to that as the market dictates. I think there has to be some, some give and take with that. Rushing to zero is going to cause havoc within the supply chain and economy. If we're not careful about it. Uh, but I hear what you're saying about friends. Um, you're creating good trade relationships. We haven't seen too many trade agreements come down the pipe lately. And I think we really need to focus on shoring that up. If we're going to transition away from China, we're going to have issues with Europe, uh, certainly about sourcing in Africa, then we need to have better, stronger trade agreements that allow us access to these minerals and can manufacture sensitive things here at home. That's going to be very key. Thank you. And I, I want to make note that, uh, you know, you said transitioning to zero is going to effectively going to be painful. And I, I want to make note that the United States has led the world in reducing emissions. For every ton of emissions we've reduced, China's gone up by four. Um, we're, not, we're not headed in the right direction, and all we're doing is, is penalizing the, the U.S. economy uh, at, at the same time. Um, any, anyone else? I, I would align my comments with with Mr. Spears, that it's, it, energy security is all about working with, with trusted allies, stable allies, and identifying trusted sources for the materials we need. We're, we all, I think, are headed in the, the same direction when it comes to re reducing emissions and alternative forms of energy. But while we work on that path, we, we've got to maintain stable, trusted resources for, for the fuels that supply us today. Hey, thank you. And I'm, I know Mr. Stauber's probably chomping at the bit, looking at this forced direction into renewable energy technologies while at the same time shutting down two mining operations in Minnesota, one in Arizona. Um, it seems entirely incompatible or even contradictory with the objectives of, uh, of, of the legislation and, and um, some of the stated commitments in terms of targets and reductions. So we certainly need to be thinking about this a little bit differently. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Mr. Desaulnier, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, and I will say thank you to the chair and the vice chair for having us here. Um, I, the context of my comments, I want the panel to realize, and my colleagues, it's in getting this investment right. Who benefits from it? I'm not against private equity getting a reasonable rate of return. It's an important partnership. But I would argue that right now we are at the, the most historical divergence between capital as a percentage of GDP and wages. So we've got to reduce that and create a new middle class that uh, President Eisenhower uh, championed. Um, so that context on the air quality side, um, sorry my colleague left as a former air regulator in California. I'm one of those bureaucrats. I think we were motivated, and I was a Republican at the time, um, by doing what the Clean Air Act said, which was signed by a Republican California president, Richard Nixon, and updated by a Republican California president that created the waiver, the California waiver. So this isn't 12 years in the future as I look at it. George Duke Magian, who was governor in the 80s, a Republican conservative, he introduced the zero emission vehicle. So, Mr. Spear, you know that we've been working at this for a long time. The challenges are not unknown to California. Most of the reductions that my colleague just uh, referred to came because of the California waiver and the 12 or so states who join us under that waiver. So in that context, uh, Mr. Spear, you mentioned President Eisenhower. One of my favorite quotes by President Eisenhower said, only a fool would try to stop an American man or American working woman from joining the union of their choice. And President Eisenhower said that when GDP was at historic records because we were building an amazing middle class. So President Reagan, <laughs> President of Fort, another President Reagan started cash buybacks or started the acceleration on open market buybacks. So what is the right rate of return for an investor and a taxpayer and an employee, a worker, a union worker under Davis-Bacon, for Congress to be looking at? And this is in the context of, and I'm not specifically saying a rate of return, I'd just like you to talk about your members and the multiplier. 
as a former small business owner, the multiplier for every one of your jobs, as memory serves me, is about 13, 14, which all goes out to small businesses in rural and urban areas. So it's really important that your investors get a reasonable rate of return, but that Main Street gets a reasonable rate of return if we want to rebuild that middle class. So just for instance, uh, the rail industry has had more cash, open market cash buybacks in 2021 than ever before. You're more profitable than ever before. Granted, you're a semi-utility, so the profit margin is smaller, but there's a, uh, historically, a supposed to be low risk, reasonable return, not low risk, high return, from my perspective. Chevron, which is headquartered back to the environmental question in my district, has a lot of employees. They just did $75 billion in cash buybacks on the back of inflated gas prices during COVID. That's not going back in the refinery in the county I represent. That's going off. As, so UP did $4.6 billion in cash buybacks in one year. No, wait, $4.6 billion in payroll and benefits, but they did $6.3 billion in cash buybacks. So, Mr. Reagan, can you talk a little bit more about what you said in your introduction about the balance between returning that investment to the workforce and capital investment in the infrastructure versus going back to the shareholder at obscene rates of return? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I, you know, I, I think that as we're looking at investing, especially the, the sums of money we're talking about right now with the Infrastructure Investment Act, um, we should be using it as an opportunity to rebuild the middle class and ultimately to invest in the people in this country. And to your point, when, you have, when people have a stable wage, when they have a middle class wage and good benefits, they are returning that money into their local economies. They're spending it at their local stores, at the local small business, businesses. They're sending their kids to college. They're doing all these things because they have the opportunity, they have a wage that allows them to do that. Um, and when you look at, you know, certainly a lot of the industries that I represent, even the private sector, um, you know, we are the antidote to this idea that unions kill businesses. Look at the airline industry, where they're, they were at the highest profitability they had been uh, in their history before the pandemic, and that is 85, 90% unionized right now. Railroads are the highest profitability they've been in the history of railroading. They're wall-to-wall -wall unionized. We can be really good partners in advancing a better system, but we also are going to expect that our members are paid fairly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Feel back. Thank you, Mr. Stauber. You're recognized. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, great conversation. I know the supply chains have been uh, really a, a big issue, and in, in particular under this administration and the decisions thereof. And I want to say great work to all of you uh, for doing what you need to do, making the decisions that you need to make to overcome this. Um, Mr. Graves was talking about supply chains and with respect to critical minerals. But before I get into that, Mr. Spear, I just have to make a comment. I appreciate what you said. Um, three weeks ago, a friend of mine took his brand new electric pickup truck down to the Vikings game, U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. Plugged it in on a charger during the game. Unfortunately, we lost. He lives 164 miles north of Minneapolis. He had to stop twice for 45 minutes each to charge his vehicle. So it took him half the time, two and a half times uh, the travel time to get home. To your point, we have to link that conversation. And in linking the conversation, we have to talk about critical minerals and supply chains. The Duluth complex, located in northern Minnesota, has 95% of our nation's nickel reserves, 88% of our nation's cobalt reserves, over a third of the copper and other platinum groups met, group metals. This administration just banned mining in northern Minnesota for 20 years. Mr. Reagan, they're my friends, they're union jobs project labor agreements. How, where are we gonna get these? And I'm telling you right, what right now, and I think you all know this. Our adversaries that control the critical minerals, it's gonna dry up for us. 
they're not going to sell. They're going to pinch the United States, and we cannot get these mines up overnight. So you're, I'm asking your industry to push back against this anti-mining stance from this administration. And it's not only in northern Minnesota, where, by the way, we've mined taconite that makes over 80% of the iron ore, or 80% of the American steel, uh, the steel in this country, which is a national security and a strategic national security interest to build our roads and bridges. We have to bring the, that sourcing back. I hear everyone during their testimony and, and reading their testimony, we have to control the destiny of this country in the palm of our own hands with the natural resources that we are blessed with. We have an administration. In October of 2020, then Canada, Joe Biden said, we're gonna mine these critical minerals domestically. Oh, what? We thought that was awesome for Northern Minnesota, awesome for our miners across this country. What did he just do? He took out the opportunity to mine these minerals here under the best environmental standards and the best labor standards. Just over a month ago, he signed a memorandum of understanding with, the, with the, uh, the Congo, which has 15 of the 19 mines owned by the Chinese government. This is where we're supposed to get our critical minerals? Give me a break. This is a dangerous administration to our country when it comes to supply chain and critical minerals and mining. The anti-jobs and anti-mining stance has to stop. And you, I'm asking you and your associations to help as an association, push back on this anti-mining stance. Push back on us relying on uh, adversarial nations for our critical minerals and our processing. And we talked about reforms. Should it take 10 years to build a bridge? Should it take 10 years to build a bridge in California, Minnesota? Should it take 20 years to open up a mine in northern Minnesota? In the same watershed, the country of Canada, our friend, opened up a gold mine, same watershed in three years. Please do your part and push back. I will, be, I will help you advocate for that. We lost multi-generational union jobs because of that political decision. Didn't even let an, an environmental impact statement move forward. That's the process for political reasons. Killed great paying jobs for my constituents. So I'm asking on behalf of the mining community, on behalf of our strategic national security, you have a voice in this and join me. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Carbajal, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Regan, we know that to maintain a healthy supply chain, we need to continue to support the Jones Act, cargo preference and maritime security program. The pandemic was a perfect example of the need to move away from relying on foreign carriers and mariners. As chair and now ranking member of the Coast Guard and Transportation Subcommittee, I've been a supporter of bolstering the, our U.S. maritime sector. Can you expand on the benefit, the benefits of enforcing and expanding the programs that bolster the U.S. maritime industry, including the Jones Act cargo preference and maritime security program? Thank you so much for the question. You, you just, uh, named the, th the three-legged stool, the stool that keeps our maritime system afloat as it is. Uh, but even with that, we have 98%, over 98% of all goods that go into and out of U.S. ports are shipped on foreign flag vessels. We have simply ceded away any sort of sea lift capacity to our competitors. Uh, and we see the, frankly, the, the consequences of that when, for example, we're trying to get goods out. There are a shortage of containers. There's a shortage. We can't. Um, there's sort of shape uh, space on board ships, and they're not taking our goods. Uh, what we need to be doing is instead of trying to whittle away at these programs like cargo preference, we need to be fully enforcing them. We need to be advocating for more U.S. built vessels. We need to be advocating to ensure that every time we are shipping goods overseas on the government dime, that we're doing it on a U.S. flag vessel with U.S. mariners, because. Once we do that, we start expanding their capacity, we are going to generate more business, and we're going to grow the mariner population, and we will be more competitive and less reliant on foreign shipping conglomerates. Thank you. Ms. Regan, I continue to read industry reports about the ongoing mariner shortage and the lack of new mariners entering the industry. This is obviously an issue of deep concern. 
Simply put, the current mariner shortage is a national security issue, as you pointed out as well, and that the Department of Defense cannot do its job if the maritime industry cannot supply enough mariners to support the DOD sea lift readiness capacity for contingencies such as global conflicts. While I understand that the core of this issue has to deal with recruitment and retention, what can Congress do in short and long term to shore up the pool of qualified mariners working in the industry? Thank you. In short term, obviously, we need to invest in the training uh, schools that are out there. Uh, it does take 10 years for an entry-level mariner to become a chief engineer or a captain. Uh, so there is a, a growth period there. Uh, but one thing we can do to attract more people into the in industry uh, certainly is improve uh, the onboard experience for mariners so that the, you know, we have to have better connectivity so people can speak with their families, better access to internet. We also need to make sure that it's a safer environment. I think there was a lot of publicity about some, uh, about some really horrific sexual assault uh, allegations that happened on board ships, and that has absolutely no place in the U.S. maritime industry. And if we don't address some of those problems, and I know the unions I represent are focused on making sure that that never happens again, we are basically casting aside half of our population who would be potential mariners for what is a very good job, one you can go see the world with. And so we need to make sure it's a safer, uh, better workplace for, for everybody. Um, and then finally, I think we need to invest in more opportunities so that there are options for shoreside work, shore side work for employees so that we can have a continued pool of mariners that are available to operate on ships, but continue to do that work if there are not opportunities at that very moment. Thank you. I was going to ask you to say short side 10 times, but I won't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Reagan, while the bipartisan infrastructure law provides over $60 billion in federal dollars for rail infrastructure, I know we need to do more to improve passenger rail and freight rail services. In your testimony, I know you highlighted the need to invest in workers. Can you delve into what that means, what you mean by that? Yeah, I, th I think, again, uh, going back to what I said earlier about making sure that we are investing in the workforce while we invest in expanded services. And I certainly believe that the money that was invested into Amtrak through the infrastructure law is going to be the, uh, you know, the catapult to get us towards a true national passenger rail system uh, and one that is, is more efficient and a better option for people in communities large and small. Uh, but we do need to have the workforce to be able to do that. I'm very happy to see that Amtrak is aggressively hiring. Uh, they had a goal of 4,000 people in FY23 uh, in order to hire that many new people into Amtrak. They hired over 3,000 people last year, uh, and they are, you know, when I talked to Stephen Gardner, the, the CEO of Amtrak, I mean, that is the number one thing in his mind, is how do we hire more people into the, into the railroad? And so I think that as we start doing that and demonstrating this is a really, another really good middle-class job, um, we will have the workforce to make a passenger rail system that we can be proud of in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Nels, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, thank the witnesses for being here today. I think this is wonderful. We're all together uh, meeting in person. Just what a treat that is. And it's no secret that the transportation sec uh, sector has experienced a series of supply chain issues, some resulting from the pandemic and others obviously resulting from the policies of this administration. And so, uh, Mr. Gunter, certainly good to see you, sir. Good to see you this morning. And, and my question uh, to you is from a port perspective, what is the best investment we can make today to minimize another supply chain crisis in the future? Thank you uh, for your question, Congressman. The, uh, talked about a little bit today, making those investments, uh, you know, in the channel, again, uh, in the operation and maintenance, but, um, you know, also making the investments of future development of our ports and waterways. So, you know, we talk about seaports are a critical link. They're served by the water side with our channels, but also on the land side and looking for those opportunities um, to continue to grow, to efficiently yeah. handle our cargo uh, is, is, is very important. And, um, you know, it was mentioned earlier um, uh, about the IA, IIJA and the amount of funding that's been made available uh, in, in the last two, you know, two billion dollars, I believe, in fiscal year 22 and a billion in fiscal year 23. Mm -hmm. um, but to maintain our channel, for instance, we've got 12 million dollars for the Houston Ship sure. Channel. So, 
we, we, we have to emphasize, if I answer your question, we have to emphasize the important things, whether it's on the water side, whether it's on the land side, to make sure that we keep freight moving. Yeah. And in your testimony, it, it says that the Houston Ship Channel has been underfunded by 50 to 60 percent as it relates to O&M dollars. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. It's my understanding also that draft restrictions are going to occur in March. Uh, what changes do I and other the Houston delegation, Houston members, need to be aware of to prevent this from happening again? In other words, what's the long-term fix for this issue? Well, the short-term fix is inevitable. We talked about, hey, do we throw money at it to fix this? But the long-term solution is looking at, um, you know, the need based upon uh, the tonnage that is served by these waterways like the Houston Ship Channel and making sure that those dollars are invested to keep, um, you, you know, to keep the channel maintained to its authorized depth and width, and we have to do that. Uh, thank you, sir. I can assure you that you have my attention. Mr. Jeffries, um, I'd like to zero in on regulations uh, affecting the rail industry. Often we hear about automated technologies in the transportation sector with media coverage and attention given to the other industries like the autos and, and drones or drones. In your testimony, you mentioned uh, ATI, which is automated track inspection, has resulted in some instances more than 90% reduction in the rate of unprotected main track defects found. Uh, so my question is, is how is FRA preventing railroads from implementing these kinds of safety enhancing technologies? And can you provide some examples, sir, how this sort of technology reduces supply chain issues? Sure, that's a great question. The, the role of a safety regular, regulator should be pretty simple, to advance safety. To advance safety in an objective, data-driven, transparent way. Not to call in political favors, not to play politics, not to, not to seek other outcomes. And we're, we're running into roadblocks in deploying technologies and advancing innovation in this industry that has undeniable safety benefits. Automated track inspection allows uh, a railroad to inspect vastly more track with a vastly higher level of frequency, with a vastly more uh, uh, sensitive uh, technology that allows for detecting potential defects before they become issues at uh, upwards of a 90% higher rate. Undeniable safety benefits. So you'd think the regulator would welcome that. Well, why are we in litigation to be able to expand that, that test program? Test program to continue to build out the data set to eventually roll it into the regulatory requirements. Again, modernizing the regulatory process. Two, the, 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 the crew size NPRM has come up. Again, the role of a safety regulator should be to advance safety. There is absolutely no data in that NPRM to support the rule moving forward. There's no, no safety outcome. And if it is a safety issue, why doesn't it apply to passenger railroads? And, and I'm looking forward to hearing more. I'm going to end with this. It doesn't get much attention, but I think it's relevant since we're discussing supply chain issues. Bathroom access for truckers. I said, what the hell do you mean bathroom access for truckers? Folks in the room, imagine you went to the office and you're there after a long commute and you said, I'd like to use the bathroom. You say, sorry, it's unavailable. You're going to have to hold it for a couple of hours. Makes no sense to me. I thought it was ridiculous. So we partnered uh, with Representative Houlihan and OIDA and women in trucking on the Trucker Bathroom Access Act. To get this figured out, uh, I encourage my colleagues to support this bipartisan legislation that ensures our truckers have access to a business's restroom when they are making a pickup or delivery. I'm kind of smiling here. I said, I can't believe Congress has to address this issue. Again, it's bipartisan, just plain common sense. I'll do everything I can to ensure this bathroom bill becomes law. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. You're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. As we continue to implement the bipartisan infrastructure law, few states stand to benefit more than my home state of Arizona. For the communities I represent, one of the top infrastructure priorities for years has been the expansion of Interstate 10. I-10 connects Arizona's two largest cities, Phoenix and Tucson, and tens of thousands of people commute along it every day. But more than that, it's also a key commercial artery for freight traffic to and from the ports in Southern California and for international commerce with our largest trading partner, Mexico. But despite being such a vital connection for freight and commuter traffic, there is still a large section, 26 miles, that is only two lanes. Every Arizonan who has taken I-10, myself included, will tell you that these two lanes are not enough. It causes heavy congestion and daily bottlenecks 
and a single crash or disabled vehicle can back up traffic for many, many miles. Not only is that inefficient and costly for people doing business, it's a serious public safety concern. The need for expansion is clear, but despite a substantial non-federal investment by the state and support from the local, tribal, and business stakeholders from across the region, we were disappointed and quite frankly very frustrated not to receive federal funding under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Laws mega grant program to finally complete this critical project. And when 90% of the mega grant funds were directed to projects east of the Mississippi, I can tell you Arizonans and our regional partners feel left behind. Like many states, Arizona cannot meet its growing needs, including on projects of regional significance like the I-10 expansion on its own. We need federal support. We need a federal partnership. It is clear to me that the allocation for mega, mega grants is not enough to advance many projects like a I-10 that must get done. And it's my hope and expectation that I-10 will receive federal support necessary to get its expansion across the finish line. My question is for Mr. Spear from the Trucking Association. Mr. Spear, good to see you. You too. I understand the ATA strongly supported the IAJA and that the American Transport Research Institute works with the Department of Transportation both to identify key points of congestion along our nation's highway system and to quantify the impact of that congestion. Given the enormous amount of commerce that moves along I-10 in Arizona, the expansion project the state has advanced has enormous national significance for our supply chains and for trucking in particular. Can you speak to the impacts that congestion has on supply chains and the importance of investment in projects like the I-10 expansion? I can, thank you. And <clears throat> I'm well aware of that stretch. I've driven it, my wife just drove it last weekend. And uh, it's, it's a problem, it's one of the chokeholds in the country that needs to be addressed. And uh, it's not just safety, I'll be, that's the top priority. It's fuel burn. Fuel burn creates emissions. When we're sitting in congestion, as I've talked about earlier, this is a key point that the IIJ can alleviate. And we come out every year with the top 100 bottlenecks. Your state has one, as you just stated. And they're not difficult to track. We, we do this with DOT initiatives. We have GPS that tracks them. We can see the speeds. It's a heat map, shows every red spot around the country where we have congestion. If you're looking for the top 100 priorities to go after, alleviating the supply chain contraction, you know, creating better safety, better environmental controls, go after the top 100 bottlenecks. It's an easy list. It just so happens, it comes out next week. So stay tuned. We do this every year. We will be shipping it up to all of you. So you can see if your districts or states are among them. Um, there shouldn't really be any surprises in there, and that should be the roadmap for DOT and states to target. It'll have such great gains for the economy, lowering inflation by getting goods to where they need to be faster. We're all gonna be paying less as a result. So I, I, I could not agree more that that is a good way to prioritize. That's great. It's also an important equity project because much of that land where the expansion would be is on the tribal community of the Gila River That's Indian correct. community as well. Thank you for that answer. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Owens, you're recognized. Thank you so much. Uh, and I wanna also add my thanks to the witnesses here. What a remarkable insight and education we're getting here. Um, and I'm excited about being part of this committee, part of this team, and adding some of the innovation and collaboration and the, the entrepreneurial spirit that Utah has to, to this, uh, this conversation. Uh, I want a couple comments and then a, a question that I wanna follow with Mr. Massett, ask you, uh, Ms. Spears. Um, well before coming into this industry, I had a passion to end and uh, a, 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 a deal with sex trafficking of women and children. Uh, it's a passion, it's a, it's a big mission of a lot of us in, in Utah. And I'll say this, well before hearing it today, being in front of you guys, uh, I've heard about how the stakeholders all have thanked and thanked for the trucking industry, for the awareness that uh, has come about throughout the years. Many people don't talk about it, they don't, they don't see it, but the industry saw it. I ended up having an opportunity to meet a victim uh, that was rescued through this process. So I wanna thank you guys for, for being aware and working on that. The other thing is uh, I was in the software industry for 30 years uh, and also had, I was, I was also a independent contractor on the side. Uh, why? Because it was not my goal to have another 
employer. I wanted to have my own business to one day be free of someone else having, on their own whim, drive my, my career. Uh, the greatest um, sector in our country is the middle class, and that's powered by business owners. So let's never forget that. And anytime we take this option away from business owners, we're, we're going to hurt our culture, uh, our future, and the idea to dream past uh, somebody else's whims. So I just want to make that point. Um, Mr. Mass was asking about the, um, the workforce supply chain. And obviously, we talked about 18 to 21. Is there anything else that Congress can do or not do? As we understand, we have to mitigate the fact that we're graying out in all these industries. Some kind of way we have to bring these young people in, knowing there's income to be made. And they can pursue their dream at a much lower cost, getting into the process. Is there anything else we can start looking at uh, and I want to start off with you, Ms. Spears, uh, that can, can help us to either get out of the way or to allow this process to, to move uh, and get this supply chain moving a little bit faster with the, the, the workforce. Well, I think it starts with training. I, you know, Greg and I are actually friends. We, we have some differences, obviously, but I don't think you'll ever hear either one of us talk or devalue training, the importance of it, especially with entering talent whether it be 18 to 20 or anyone coming into our industry, we want to make certain, first and foremost, that they can safely and responsibly do their job. We want them to get home to their families at night safely. I mean, that's, that's something we should all want. So training is absolutely paramount, and ensuring that they have the right standards uh, in place across the board. Entry-level driver training comes to mind. This is a rulemaking that we do support. Um, I think exemptions uh, for certain folks to not comply with that um, based on what segments of our industry they're in create inconsistencies in that. I think we all need training. And, uh, you know, I, I go through it myself at work. You know, we're aware of a lot of things in our work environment that are reoccurring every year. And we remind ourselves of that. So I, I can't emphasize that enough, the importance of it. Developing a good workforce to replace those that retire and exit is absolutely critical on training. Is anybody, Ms. Triffers, would you like to add to that? Absolutely. I, the, the training piece is critical. You know, I, we're, we're immensely proud of, of our workforce who does a remarkable job moving America's freight day in and day out, doing it safely. And these are strong middle class jobs. We have 12 unions on our properties. Average wages and benefits at $160,000 with some of the best health care, some of the lowest employee cost shares of any industry out there. And that's what something you can do on a GED. That, that, that doesn't happen a lot in this country anymore. And so, you know, Greg and I are aligned on those goals. We can debate about a lot of things, but I think that strong, well-compensated workforce is key. You know, Chris mentioned the, 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 the drug testing issue earlier. That's something that affects our industry equally as much. You know, we, we bring in classes of prospective recruits we wash out upwards of half of them, you know, day two, once they realize there's, there's drug testing requirements, federal drug regulations. Um, we've got to continue to work on that front. And then really just at a broader level, it's all about a, a pro-innovation, regulatory modernization push encouragement from this committee about really pushing technology all in the advancement of safety and efficiency. It's gotta be supported by data. If the data doesn't support it, it doesn't make sense. But really a, a, a push that looks toward the future versus looking backwards. We still have regulations from the steam engine era on our regulatory books. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for, for wins. Well, thank you. And again, I think we realize over COVID that this is truly the backbone of our, of our country of uh, moving product and, uh, and building a business of the, the middle class. So thank you so much for that. And we look forward to working with you for sure. Thank you, sir. Mr. Allred, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, want to thank our witnesses for their testimony. I think this is an important hearing. Uh, and I look forward to continuing our committee's focus on alleviating supply chain disruptions and making sure that consumers and businesses can get the goods that they need. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the uh, Supply Chain Caucus uh, here in the House. And I'm pleased at some of the progress that we've made, and even though I know that we have a lot more work to do. And you know, I think that we, Mr. Gunther, I wanted to begin with you uh, because obviously as a Texan, uh, from, not from Houston, but from Dallas, uh, the story of the Port of Houston uh, is informative uh, because you know, in your testimony, as Mr. Niels mentioned, you noted that the Houston Ship Channel has been underfunded by 50 to 60%, resulting in draft restrictions throughout the channel. Uh, and you know, when we talk about important investments like we were making in the IIJA, 
this is why we want to make these investments, so that we don't, then when a crisis comes along, we have to come here and ask you, you know, why is the Houston Port Channel not operating to max efficiency? It's because of the, I mean, what does a draft restriction mean for you? Just for my constituents back home, what does that mean for them in terms of? It's, uh, it's pretty simple. You know, we have a 45-foot operating draft, and, and, and uh, we have a 45-foot channel that goes through a bay that naturally wants to be seven or eight feet. It's continuing to uh, silt in. So if it silts in without, uh, you know, regular funding and gets to 43, 42 feet or whatever, it restricts the amount of cargo that the ship can carry, costing more money. So you have ships sitting out in deeper water, oftentimes, right? And you'll have to have... No, they, 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 they actually don't load because they know how deep well, the channel they know they is can't before they leave it, right. their origin. So right. yeah, it limits what they put on from the beginning. And so it's, it has a cost to our overall economy. Obviously, is the biggest regional port. It has huge costs uh, to our region. That's why these investments are so important. That's why you know, I find it a little bit frustrating when people will... You know, say they didn't support the IHA. This is historic investment. It might not be everything that you wanted. It's not everything that I wanted. But for the first time in decades, we finally said we're going to make a serious investment in American infrastructure. We're going to try and address some of these issues. I, as you know, I've supported uh, full fund, you know, federal funding for the uh, Houston Ship Channel, and I want to make sure we do that. Uh, and you know, I know that there are ripple effects from your port that come that we feel all the way in Dallas. Uh, you mentioned the need for investments to plan for future demand uh, to ensure incoming cargo has a place to go instead of sitting at the port. I know many of the cargo distribution centers are in my district in Dallas. And so I'm wondering how ports can work with other sectors of, of the supply chain to manage demand and move cargo more efficiently. Well, thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, we know uh, Dallas is, uh, is, is a big hub for, um, you know, distribution centers and a lot of that cargo comes through the port. You know, some an, an example of what we've looked at is things that maybe we wish we would have had during the supply chain, like either nearby inland depots or, or further away, to be able to move freight through, to move ships faster, and uh, we didn't have that capability. We applied for a mega grant, um, you know, to because we thought that that kind of met the needs of what um, uh, was necessary for the supply chain to, uh, to, to remain fluid in the future. Um, we, uh, we weren't selected for this grant cycle, but um, we, we certainly have a plan of fine tuning that or whatever, but those type of investments, I keep talking about the water side, but also it's very important on the land side, the opportunities to perhaps uh, move freight uh, more efficient uh, you know, nights, weekends, and, and, and utilization of off hours and doing those time and, and, and that infrastructure investment is very important in making that happen. So uh, thank you for your interest in that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Regan, as we talk about uh, your workforce issues, I'm a former uh, union member myself in the NFL Players Association. You know, how do we, to me, we make jobs more attractive. That's how you get young people to go into them. So it's a career that they can make a good wage in, that they can be treated right in, they can retire with dignity. Uh, what do you see in the implementation uh, of the IAJ that we need to be doing better by our union workforce? Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I, and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I think if you look at one of the best ways to have job retention in any industry is have a union. Because we're there fighting for you, someone's got your back. And for us, you look at the way we're investing, and, and we're lucky enough in transportation to have one of the highest union densities of any sector in this country. Uh, and that is, in my view, why transportation has been for so long an oasis of middle class jobs in an area where too often we've seen wage suppression in this country. Transportation has high union density, and because of that, we have a lot of people who are able to uh, deliver their, for their families and have good wages and benefits. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I went over, I yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Yakum, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's clear that reckless spending from the last two years has stoked runaway inflation. From the food on the table to the table itself, to the trucks and trains transporting the food and tables, Americans were hit hard in the last two years with inflation. I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues to get inflation under control and put our fiscal house in order. By definition, inflation causes your dollar to go less far than it once did. 
I had one of my constituents in my office talking about a massive infrastructure project within my district that because of inflation is now going to cost a project projected $10 million more, and it's an important infrastructure project that we need. Mr. Spear, can you talk about how inflation has impacted your industry, whether it's CapEx, delays, foregone projects, labor rates, and how it, those increased costs have impacted our supply chain? Certainly, I, I think that um, you know inflation, as we look at the impact it's had on fuel pricing, it's our second biggest cost burn, right under what we pay our employees. And uh, when you're seeing it more than double, even triple in certain parts of the country, um, that is a major headwind in terms of operations. And uh, you know, our ability to get you know, goods to where they need to be with a shortage that we're experiencing in driver force, um, the cost of fuel is, is really impactful. So we've seen that spike considerably and diesel is still rising, uh, you know, riding higher than, than petrol. So uh, it is a major concern. Um, a lot of those costs uh, we try to pass on. If you're in contract fleets, uh, you can do some of that. Um, for a good number of, of companies and owner operators, that, that's not the case. So it's even more impactful on them. So we'd love to see the fuel prices get back to where they were pre-COVID. Thank you. Mr. Jeffrey, same question. Yeah, it has an impact across the board. So whether it's a cost of goods of doing business, that increases the cost of goods sold or the cost of services you're providing, which at the end of the day makes its way to the consumer, which reduces buying power, which has an overarching economic impact. You know, I would, I would pair... Um, we, we've talked a lot about permitting, permitting reform, delays in, in putting, getting projects to work. That's only exacerbated by inflation. You know, you, you get delayed by one, two years. Uh, you know, my colleague mentioned this earlier, and you're in a high inflation environment. Well, that jacks up the price of the overarching project dramatically so that the funds, the CapEx funds you had put aside for that project may not cover that, and maybe you're not doing that project anymore. So it is not just things are cost more. It is, it's impacting investment. It's impacting, uh, it's impacting project delivery, project development as well. And Mr. Jeffries, you mentioned earlier that uh, the, the amount of dollars that the railroad industry is putting into CapEx for, um, for rail improvements around the country. Can you tell us, and maybe you have data on this, maybe you don't, but what's the scope of projects that have gone up in price and in totality, how many projects have you not done because of inflation. So I don't know if I can put a put an, <laughs> a number on there. I will say this, you know, there, there's a, a, a vast number of projects that we do every year regardless of the cost because they have to be done to maintain a, a, self, a safe railroad. A well-maintained railroad is a safe railroad. So when it comes to that maintenance, that keeping the, the existing infrastructure where it needs to be, that's happening one way or another because it has to be done. But where I think you see the hits are, um, you know, on potential capacity expansions, et cetera, that, that you know, a, a railroad of, of any size is gonna take another look at. If suddenly it's you know, 10, 15, 20% more to do that, maybe you're not doing that in that year. But I, I admittedly, I can't point to, those are individual business decisions that railroads are gonna make on their own. And so you're still making those investments, and it's probably fair to say that the increased cost is being passed on to the consumer. Is that a fair assessment? Well, it's certainly having an impact, uh, I'll say that, at the end of the day. Great, thank you. And Mr. First, same question. I would say that uh, from, you know, for us, after we get a project, it's, uh, you know, it could be a couple of years long, could be six months or whatever. It's the, it's the supplies, right? It's the wood that we have to buy that uh, spikes up and down, for instance, to, to form the bridge decks, form the piers, form the columns, hammerheads, et cetera. It's those incidentals that we have no control over where we can't lock in pricing ahead of time uh, so I would say that was that would be the the biggest hit that we take usually, and and you know we can't pass that along to owners ahead of time because we don't know you know can't buy it right then and there uh, if we can even get it and everything. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, sir, Mr. Auchincloss. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Last Congress, we were able to pass historic legislation to meet our ambitious climate goals, but until clean energy projects are up and running these investments will not realize their full potential. Massachusetts is working on this implementation at every level. Our new governor, Maura Healey, made tackling climate change a central part of her work as Attorney General and is now working with offshore wind developers to ensure the Commonwealth is able to reach its 2030 emissions target. 
failure to make this transition has implications beyond climate change. It also threatens jobs, guaranteed by the first project labor agreement for an industrial scale offshore wind project in the United States. In my district, Bristol Community College's National Offshore Wind Institute offers basic and advanced safety and technical training programs to prepare workers for jobs in construction, deployment, operations, and maintenance of offshore wind farms. Unfortunately, inflation and supply chain issues have threatened to derail the Bay State's goals and delay our transition to a green energy economy. Mr. Firth, in that vein, my, my first question is for you. Uh, you noted in your testimony the difficulty the construction industry is facing in purchasing materials like steel uh, creates a significant risk to businesses. Uh, how can Congress create additional market certainty for these manufacturers? And for multi-year contracts, what steps should contractors be taking to incorporate market rates uncertainty in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when we get a, at bid time, you know, our estimators are pulling their hairs out because as, you know, let's say at nine o'clock, you got to turn in the bid. And, and when I say a bid, it's low bid pricing, right? Um, we might be getting quotes at 855 and we're sitting there trying to figure out, okay, how, how low are they? Are they cheap or are they, are they more expensive? And then also then they say, you know, by the way, you need to let us know by the end of the day whether or not you can lock in our price. We might not even know if we got the job because maybe the job is over budget from the owner's perspective, right? They have an engineer's estimate and everything. So if all of a sudden, you know, for us, we're taking huge risks on, okay, well, maybe we were low bidder, but we were over the engineer's estimate. Will it be awarded? Um, and then, by the way, we got to lock in to a price to where we might not even know if we get the project or not. Um, you know, so something along those lines to where I think some of the, um, the owners are starting to look at separate contracts ahead of time that they know as, as they talk to industry about, you know, what can we do to, to help. Maybe it's procuring those permanent materials, such as steel girders for bridges or whatnot. Um, so I, I think, you know, more of that and getting more industry uh, feedback would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spear, I have a separate question for you, but first I do need to respond to your points in your testimony about the Federal Highway uh, Administration's 20, uh, 2021 memo, I think it was, that you referred to. Um, just to be clear, uh, first of all, over the last three decades, Congress has made highway program funding more and more flexible. And that is in, partly in response to the fact that the public is deeply concerned about deferred maintenance and repairs. They expect us to be a good steward of their tax dollars. And states are still free to make their own investment choices. But being a good steward of those dollars would suggest that we should fix the four million mile road system that we've already built first. Uh, and I would also take some issue with your point that highway widening is gonna be the answer to congestion. Uh, I think we have seen that widening roads induces demand. We need to manage more in intelligently the roadways that we have, whether it's HOV lanes, whether it's congestion pricing. Uh, we have got to um, think beyond simply the physical infrastructure and instead the pricing mechanics that we use and the management mechanics that we use. My question for you, though, is about the reauthorization of the NTSB. And one issue I want to explore is truck safety data ownership. Cars and commercial trucks continue to become more advanced, and as a result, they will produce more data that we can utilize to make our roads safer. If drivers and mechanics and regulators and insurance companies can access it, um, do commercial trucking companies have access to and sole authority over their truck data, to your knowledge? They do. Telematics is our property. And what would you, what are your thoughts on the increasing push by OEMs to own that data or to lay claim to it in some I think manner? it's probably better answered by the OEMs, but, but it belongs to them. They produce the product, they sell the product, they maintain the product, to sell it off to somebody else to service it, have access to it, including the government. That's a big debate, and we're not the only ones facing that question that you pose. The autos are too. So. Uh, telematics is a very sticky issue, and it's, it's been litigated heavily in states, also legislated in states. So uh, it's an issue that we're not foreign to. Look forward to working with you on it. Absolutely. Yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. LaMalfa, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my apologies to the uh, rest of the committee and others for uh, dueling committees going on. So if anything I ask is redundant, please uh, forgive me on that uh, today. So. Um, let me jump right into um, 
an interesting piece on a California driver, truck driver, a woman who had uh, really, you know, sought and kind of met her dream. Let me just read a little excerpt of what she had uh, commented on a news piece just a couple days ago. Uh, jumping in here. I often reflect on where my dream started. Her name is Dee Sova. I reflect on where my dream started, what could have been. As a black woman, I had built a successful business and created a profitable path in an industry that once had belonged almost exclusively to men. Then the California legislature stepped in and took that all away from me. They forced me to say goodbye to the place I once called home for decades. I'm blessed to have successfully moved to a more business-friendly state, Missouri, it turns out, but not everyone has the resources to do so. So since Assembly Bill 5, which has been talked about a lot, has gone into effect, thousands of more independent truckers in California have been thrust into legal limbo. Lawmakers have given other industries a carve out from AB 5. They continue to deny, deny truck drivers that same opportunity. Again, that's Dee Sova who gave up, filled her truck, and left California for greener pastures in Missouri. So the, the bill, AB 5, was pitched as a bill to protect workers from having their benefits cut and being forced instead uh, and, or they're alleged that they would be forced to be independent contractors. The, uh, the supermajority in Sacramento created exemptions for their favorite industries, not truckers. So what we know is that the vast majority of trucking companies are small and they're mom and pop, but all, you know, all are welcome. But it sets a terrible precedent that a state is being allowed to interfere with the trucking employment requirements, which indeed have ramifications across in the whole country and across many industries. So one of the feelings of being a trucker is to be able to have freedom and flexibility for contracted employment. Now, every, every driver will have to charge more. It'll, things become even more expensive. Every piece of cargo, every box of cereal on a shelf, et cetera, will have to cost more and further delaying an already bogged down supply chain and delay. So Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this article into the record, um, if I may. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me ask Mr. Spear from ATA on this. Um, now, I probably don't have to really ask it, but how, how have, you, have you seen motor carriers leaving the state of California? I mean, we kind of know the answer to that question, or more planning to do so. What kind of numbers, I guess, uh, yes, um, I do. Are, are we losing? I think I saw where 70,000 as of January 1st would be completely ineligible, if I'm thinking correctly. It is a significant number, and Ms. Sova's story is one of many, and I, I know her well. Uh, very, very, very proud to have her as an ATA America's road team captain. She is an outstanding driver, and uh, when she speaks, I think people do listen. It's what I said earlier. I think we need to talk more to the independent contractors. Did somebody force you to do this? Some heavy-handed employer, you know, push you into this category so they didn't have to pay you as much or give you benefits? You will find but the answer you get is just the opposite of what you think. I mean, it, it, you listen to what she has to say. She chose this for a reason. She wants to grow her own business. She wants to employ other drivers. Most of our big members started with one truck as ICs. It's been around for 90 years. I'm not saying any category isn't per, is perfect. It's not. Let's don't make this into a national crisis. It, this is a sound contributing workforce to the trucking industry, and it's under assault in California. So, yeah, we're a bit bullish about that. And by the way, a lot of employers have to have contractual provisions in their IC contracts that adhere to health, safety, environment, and taxation standards. That's part of the deal. And when they don't, there's consequences for that. Yeah, yeah, there is consequences. Um, is uh, ATA, other members, other contractors receiving uh, type of guidance that is helpful from either the state or, or the federal government and how to deal with these regulations. Is it is it clear how they should be complying or is it murky? Get a lawyer. Get a lawyer, great. I just like to be a trucker out on the open road and haul okay. things and unload and get in my sleeper when I need to, you know? I mean, it's just, yeah, getting a lawyer isn't really part of that. Nope. Not so, a good answer, I apologize. No, no. It's I, the truth. No, you gave a real answer, so. Um, let me jump over to Mr. Gunther from uh, Port Houston here. Um, I could go into it bigger, but uh, some of our supply chain issues seem to be subsiding somewhat. I don't think they're over by any means. What should we be doing to keep our ports and import export system to improve on efficiency? And I, I come from the ag sector who we've just been brutalized in California getting 
the ag products back onto boats. Um, Quick Mr. answer, Chairman. Mr. Gunther. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Th thank you, great question. Um, you know, yes, it's uh, tapering off in the U.S. Uh, I can speak for Houston. We're uh, still at a pretty high level, but regardless, to your point, uh, a lot of Im import cargo dwelling on the terminals e impacted the export cargo on the terminals. I think a short answer that we've talked about is the ability to have more uh, visibility to an in information about the cargo coming and going, uh, you know, and also, uh, you know, having more uh, access to, to infrastructure, whether it's inland depots moving cargo off the terminal or uh, storing uh, more accessibly. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, everybody buy more walnuts. That will help a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Just remind members that we are up against the floor vote schedule, so uh, move as expeditiously as we can. Uh, Ms. Hoyle, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank all the witnesses for coming here to testify. Um, the weakness in our supply chain became very clear at the West Coast ports during the recent crisis, and one vital way to minimize future supply chain backups in our ports is to expand capacity. The workers at the ports of Seattle and Long Beach move almost 20 million TEUs per year. But as we've seen, the corporate focus of achieving low prices and profit by offshoring U.S. manufacturing jobs combined with a long time lack in federal investment in our transportation infrastructure has left the United States vulnerable. The pandemic created that per perfect storm resulting in critical shortages of necessary goods and a massive supply chain congestion on the West Coast ports. So as we move to bring manufacturing back to the US, we're gonna need to make sure our port infrastructure can keep up so US firms can get their products to international markets. We have an opportunity um, and uh, Mr. Firth knows all about it, in um, building a new deep water container terminal port at the International Port of Coos Bay, which is in my district in Southwest Oregon, and is a public-private partnership with North Point, a company based in the district of Chairman Graves. Unfortunately, this project was recently de denied a DOT mega grant in the first round of grant funds, even though it is exactly the type of new investment that we need to address our supply chain issues and the inflation that is exacerbated by it. So we'll be applying in the next round and I'll work with anyone um, to help make that happen. Um, before I ask questions of the panel, I wanna provide more background about the project. It would create the only West Coast ship to rail container port where maritime shipping freight can be loaded directly onto rail cars and shipped directly to the rest of the country. Uh, bringing this kind of infrastructure online could increase West Coast port capacity by up to 10 to 12 percent. No place along the West Coast has that ability. Um, the port, which is the largest deep water port between Puget Sound and San Francisco, has hundreds of acres un of, un of undeveloped industrial land, uh, quick access to the open ocean, and the West Coast lacks any sort of resi resiliency. If we lose one port due to a man-made or natural disaster, that problem will be significantly worse. 70% um, of the containers that move through ports on the West Coast of Canada are destined for the United States. Meanwhile, the Canadian federal government is investing in their ports. I can't understand why we would choose not to invest in our own ports and forfeit all that ship traffic and all the American jobs that go with it. So with that, um, first, Mr. Regan, and if there is time, Mr. Firth, um, as Oregon's labor commissioner, I saw too often that people in the trades and transportation jobs were recruited by what, what we would call the FBI model of recruitment. Father, brother, in-law. If your father, brother, or in-law were in the trades, then you get into the trades. Um, we worked very hard with business, with labor, um, to change how we did outreach and retention because diversity and recruitment means nothing if you can't create an environment for that diverse workforce to feel safe and supported to stay in those jobs. We addressed some of those issues earlier. Um, Mr. Regan, can you expand on how investing in the transportation workforce, workforce development, recruitment to the many high quality registered apprenticeship programs that will arise through the record investment of the IA, IIJA can help, some, uh, help address some of these supply chain problems. Yes, and thank you so much for that question. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I think that we, the workforce is what's driving 
the supply chain. They are the backbone. They're the ones performing the work, whether they be the longshoremen in the ports, whether they be operating the trains, whether they be driving trucks. Um, they are the core of this. And I think having more money available and critically having money available for workforce training in the very beginning of these grant programs means that we are going to be able to build the workforce of the future that can actually deliver as demand is going to continue to increase. We are go not going to see a decrease in cargo anytime soon. So we want to be able to make sure that we have the workforce ready to meet those needs. And we've also had an increased focus on diversifying the workforce and transportation, making sure that we recruit more women, more people of color, to make sure that we have a, a workforce that's representative of the country and that opportunities are available for everyone in this country to have a good paying middle class job. Thank you, very briefly. Uh, I, I think that uh, if we could increase the, the career uh, money into the career and technical education programs, I think that would be fabulous. I mean, I, I personally think that we try to tell younger kids that you have to go to college. You can really make a great career in, our, in, in any of our uh, trades, right? I, it, it's just great. Thank you. Gentlemen, time's expired. Mr. Desposito, you're recognized. Well, thank you, uh, and to the panel, thank you for your time today. As a native Long Islander, I firsthand know the value the supply chain industry brings to our economy. My district heavily relies on the trucking for freight needs at, in its vicinity to uh, both JFK Airport and the ports in New Jersey. Uh, companies like Canex Express from Valley Stream and K1 Logistics, whose owners live in Long Beach and East Rockaway, have suffered economic burdens as a result of the freight container backlog and strained resources. From prolonged stalling at port to congestion, uh, incurring additional fees, and at times not able to receive their cargo, Long Island truckers, our small businesses and consumers, are having to foot the ramifications of supply chain inadequacies. Uh, Mr. Spear, as our local ports and truckers work overtime to meet the market's demands, do you feel that the current administration has made it a priority to implement ocean shipping reforms that ensure supply chain efficiency? I've seen good dialogue uh, led by the White House National Economic Council on, on supply chain, particularly ports. I think passage uh, this body by uh, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act is a significant step forward. Uh, I think there needs to be some continued discussions with this administration about what more we can do to ensure that our supply chain is streamlined and resistant, resilient uh, to these pressures. Um, I think box rules, uh, we're currently litigating uh, chassis choice, availability of chassis. Uh, we're being told by ocean shippers that these are the chassis you have to use. Uh, that creates backlog, creates contractions within our ability to move those boxes faster uh, we need chassis choice, and that's something that uh, uh, whether this body chooses to legislate, we are litigating, as I said, uh, but it is a racket. It's just pure and simple. It's more of the same. Um, and I think looking for ways that we can get more, more efficiencies within the port, within drage, uh, to ensure that we can you know, stack higher, move you know, off-site, push to rail, push to ch chassis faster, these are all things that are going to make improvements going forward, but we need to continue the dialogue. Thank you. Uh, and again, uh, I have two manufacturers on Long Island that closed in the last six months, citing the inability to keep up with their inflated supply chain costs. Do you believe that the current administration's lack of prioritization for shipping reform and cutting through the red tape is preventing small businesses like these on Long Island and in Nassau County from operating and thus forcing some to close? Well, I think a lot of communities around the country are entirely dependent on trucks. You were just cited, uh, you know, Ian mentioned earlier, you know, first mile on, last mile off. You're going to have to involve a, a truck and a driver to get it to where it needs to be. So small businesses generally serve those communities. Um, they, they are there at night uh, when they go home to their families. So making certain that they remain capable in delivering those, those goods is is instrumental, it, it's just not large cities. It's, it's the communities around the country that deserve attention to that. So yeah, we're very mindful of it. It's something that we're gonna continue to represent at the table when we're talking about these efficiencies. Uh, it's not lost on us. Well, thank you, thank you all for your time. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, sir. I uh, now recognize uh, Ms. Fushi for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here today. Uh, my district in North Carolina is home to world-class uh, research universities and community colleges, vibrant small businesses, community-oriented nonprofits, and Research Triangle Park, a premier global innovation center and the nation's largest uh, research park. My district also one of the fastest growing areas in the entire country, and we are, of course, feeling the effects of growing pains. We're struggling to keep up with the demands that come with the rapid growth of an area, and this is unfortunately reflected in our transportation infrastructure. I know how critical it is for our communities to have robust and resilient infrastructure and accessible and reliable transportation systems. I look forward to tackling some of these problems and issues as a member of this committee. As we work to improve and modernize our transportation systems, we must also talk about the implementation of clean transportation and how this affects our current workforce. So my first question today is for Mr. Jeffries. Um, Mr. Jeffries, one of um, the benefits, well, you've indicated that one of the benefits of a functioning freight rail network is the ability of the freight railroads to move a ton of freight nearly 500 miles on just one gallon of fuel. And I understand that some of the class one railroads are exploring battery electric locomotives to further reduce their emissions. So if you could please tell me how railroads are preparing their workers to ensure that their skills grow with these changes. Well, that's a great question and a, uh, a broad question because the, the challenge of further reducing emissions is, is, is an immense one. But to your point, as we stand here today, freight rail is the most environmentally friendly way of moving goods across land. Uh, but we've got a lot more work to do. Um, we, we're we investing in battery electric, we're investing in hydrogen, we're investing in additional biofuels, and all of the class ones have signed up and agreed to science-based targets initiatives when it comes to targeted emissions reductions in the next 10 years uh, in line with the Paris Treaty. And that's gonna take an all, uh, all hands on deck approach and all options approach. Um, so that's investment in our yards. That's investment to reduce emissions uh, with our propulsion, anti-idling, reducing friction between wheel and, and track. And uh, you know that's why we're exploring every opportunity. That's why we're, we're, we, we have uh, test locomotives, test battery electric locomotives out in revenue service. That's why we're deploying uh, battery switcher locomotives in yards. Uh, it's all about reducing that top line emissions level. And quite frankly, our customers expect that from us. We can become a, a, a tool to help them reduce their overarching you know, uh, tooth to tail emissions because they're focused on their supply chain. So the, the better value proposition we have on that front, the more attractive we are to a customer. And I'll just add in, in your area of North Carolina, one, we have a wholly owned subsidiary uh, uh, IT company located in Cary, I know nearby, not, not directly right there, but there's also an immense amount of rail investment going on in North Carolina, both on the passenger front and the freight front. Thank you for that. And Mr. Regan, um, how can we ensure that we are still prioritizing workers as we incorporate these new technologies into transportation like zero emission technology? Thank you. I think that's a really important question <clears throat> in all areas of technology as we start to see it be deployed in transportation. Um, we view in, in the labor community, we, we are not opposed to technology. We embrace it. We have generations of embracing technological change throughout transportation. Um, what we ask for, though, is that we want to make sure that as we're advancing our technological capabilities, we're also advancing our workforce, making sure that there are training opportunities so that the existing workforce has the ability to move, advance their careers as the technology changes. Likewise, we wanna make sure that any introduction of new technology is done so in a way that improves safety across the board. It should never be used as an opportunity simply to remove a worker. It, it should be done in concert with the experts who are doing the jobs so that they can actually enhance safety and combine that with the human expertise that has been doing it for a very long time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and Mr. Johnson, uh, you are recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And obviously, I'm pleased that the committee is making the supply chain such a high priority this year. I think it builds on the success that Mr. Garamendi, my friend from California, and I had last year with the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Uh, it is already having uh, an impact on helping to heal some of the supply chain issues, but obviously nobody's alleging the supply chain is as healthy as we want it to be yet. That's why I'm working with Mr. Costa on the Ship It Act, uh, which attempts to address a number of different uh, issues or deficiencies uh, within the trucking arena. And uh, without objection, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask for statements of support for the Ship It Act uh, to be entered into the record from the Consumer Brands Association and from the Shippers Coalition. Without objection, so ordered. Very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Spear, I, I would, uh, was grateful to see in your testimony and hear in your testimony a reference to the o Ocean Shipping Reform Act, uh, holding that up as a success of the last Congress. I think uh, today, gentlemen, you have got a sense of the hunger and the appetite that this committee has to continue to build on those successes. So the question to you, Mr. Spear, what, are, what top three pressing issues or ideas do we need to pursue in this committee to continue to build on OSRA's success? I think transparency is really good. The accurate invoices, you know, resolving disputes, these are all good things that'll come from this law that we, we strongly support it, so well done. Uh, I think looking ahead, as I just spoke earlier about the box rules, I think, you know, we're litigating chassis choice. Being able to pick, we talk about choice a lot, but being able to pick which chassis you can use uh, these are ocean shippers that are, that are applying a lot of leverage on us, acting like cartels. It's exactly what OSRA was, was meant to diffuse. So going forward, I think uh, ensuring that we have choice, we can move those boxes much faster. Um, this is uh, something we are litigating, uh, but that is an area certainly to provide oversight at a minimum uh, because it really is a racket. Uh, we are looking also at uh, instances where ports, uh, particularly in California, are electrifying much more rapidly uh, than, than um, other parts of the country. And I, I just have to say that, that you know, about 60% of, of those that are operating in dredge um, are less than 20 trucks. So the affordability of that equipment in that amount of time, uh, assuming it's available, assuming it can be charged, that's a good environment certainly to incubate this sort of thing. Um, but the ratio, the cost ratio between an electric truck and, and a diesel power truck is like five to one. They're not gonna be able to afford this. So that, that is literally nearly 30% of the boxes being moved. If those less than 20 go, you're gonna have a real issue on your hands. So I, I think we need to look again about the timelines. Let's incubate you know, alternative energy uh, into the workplace, but let's do it in a responsible way that doesn't put people out of business, doesn't cause more bottlenecks within the supply chain. Well, and certainly the conversations continue, and Mr. Garamendi and I are working on an OSRA 2.0 to try to address some of the outstanding issues. Mr. Gunther, for you, I want to pick your brain a little bit about Log Inc. You probably know more about it than I do, but I believe this is a Chinese developed logistics software system, a platform that they are attempting to foist upon uh, ports and other stakeholders. Now they're giving it away free. It collects tremendous amount of data, which can then be centralized inside China to provide uh, no doubt competitive advantage. Our, I have grave concerns about the Log Inc. system. I wonder whether or not it should be used by anybody in America. Are my concerns mis misplaced? Well, uh, if you could, I'm not aware of that. What was the name of that? Log Inc. So it's capital L-O-G-I-N-K. Okay. And it is a data management yep. logistical tracking uh, yep. software that tells about what's uh, what, what cargo is there, where it's headed, where it's coming from. Uh, just a tremendous amount of information. Uh, I'm not aware of that software, but obviously it's a concern. Uh, you know, cybersecurity, our, our, the... the um, fluidity and efficiency of container terminals uh, in the U.S. rely on robust and very smart operating systems, right? So we have to make sure that those are, are protected from a cybersecurity standpoint or whatever. So I'm not aware of that, unfortunately. However, uh, we do know that um, uh, we continue to, uh, you, you know, most of the equipment, they are most, a lot of the equipment that we do use of, uh, at our port, ship short cranes and those type of things are made in the Republic of China. So, um, you know, 
we're, we're aware of any system, no matter where it's from, to make sure that uh, it's not infiltrated and data, data breached or whatever on it, because we all know that we're attacked each and every day uh, at every port in the nation, so we gotta be, uh, make sure that we're vigilant, uh, vigilant about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, expired. my time has expired. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, Mr. Westman, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses <clears throat> for being here today. Uh, we had a lot going on in other committees, so I missed uh, a lot of your testimony, but I uh, do appreciate you coming here and, and visiting with the committee. Um, you know, I've got some grave concerns about our federal permitting process. I remember in the last Congress, you know, we had the largest infrastructure bill in the history of the world that never even came through this committee, but we did do some, uh, we worked on some other bills that unfortunately never uh, got any kind of traction in the last Congress. And I remember talking with my Democrat colleagues about, um, you know, they're, they're focusing on the wrong issue. They're trying to put a lot of money out there, but they're not gonna be able to do their projects any more than, than anybody else would be able to do them because of permitting issues. And if we take a quick look at, at DOT's Federal Environmental Review and Authorization Inventory, uh, that, identi that identifies the most commonly used red tape laws and regulation, it outlines a massive list of 64 separate permits and reviews, and that's just the list of the most common hurdles. With the constant need to improve our infrastructure, um, and we'll just go down the, the table there, can you uh, speak to me about what issues you and your colleagues are facing that are delaying your ability to improve that infrastructure, and what are the most egregious permitting roadblocks? Mr. Spear, we'll talk, start with you. Thank you, Congressman. I I think we work very closely with our state associations, with state DOTs, to really identify the projects that need to be shovel ready and really moving them forward through the environmental impact process uh, to ensure that they are uh, teed up and have access to the funding, shared funding that uh, could hopefully come through the IIJA. And uh, that you know, we focus on the top projects, we would deem those as being the ones that have the most congestion in the country. And, there's, a, there's a, a number of ways that you can deal with congestion, um, but we need to prioritize. Those should be projects that we are looking at well ahead because we report on them every year. We know what they are. So it shouldn't come as any shock that, that these things get through the process much quicker, um, get more attention, and you know, speed up that permit process so that, that these projects are underway and, and done. Yeah, I think we see it across the board, whether it's investing in new yards, yard expansion, whether it's uh, adding, uh, you know, second lines of rail, whether it's bridge replacement. And there are common sense solutions. We, we saw some progress over the past uh, few years with the one federal decision, but that's limited to certain agencies. Um, really, it's just all about predictability in the process. Put some timelines on it, identify what the criteria are that are gonna be evaluated, and take this just open-ended guessing game out of it, and folks can work around it. I think predictability and certainty is all the community wants, so it can make its investments and decisions with some level of confidence of when they're gonna be able to put dollars to work. Yeah, but as, a, as an engineer who did a lot of projects before I came to Congress, I can certainly agree about uh, predictability and removing uncertainty. Engineers like those sorts of things for a good reason. Mr. Firth. Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. I, you know, going back, I, I think it's having that uh, flexibility and the expediency in, in the review process. Not all contractors look at a job at the same um, line of, of, of construction, you might say. Um, you know, we all have different means and methods on how we attack something. And so when uh, you're kind of pigeonholed into a, a permit and, you know, sometimes the owners need to, I think, engage industry a little bit more on how to get something permitted, um, having that communication open so then that way the project can get through the first time and not get a, get a hurdle or a roadblock later down the road. And just to add to that, you know, uh, the permitting process is certainly, uh, it, w it was asked earlier about any delays and, you know, on the water side, talk about the uh, opportunities, some of the, some of the issues uh, that the core has, you know, in the time it takes to review and approve it, just a standard project. And, you know, that may, we, we just need to make sure that there's not a lack of funding for regulatory staff and making sure that there are no delays going through the environmental process. And, 
you know, maybe uh, look at some type of time limits that we need to have on these so we can have some uncertainty from the, for the projects. I know I hear from our dredging industry, right, that is dependent upon these projects and is a finite amount of dredges. You know, they, 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 there need to be some consistency and reliability Mr. as well. Mr. Reagan, I, I apologize if I'm out of time and I ask to submit this letter from the National Mining Association. Without objection, so ordered. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Kane, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to thank the Chairman for holding this important hearing today on the state of our nation's transportation infrastructure and supply chain challenges. I also want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. The 7th Congressional District in New Jersey is home to some of the uh, most significant transportation challenges and opportunities in the country. It actually stretches all the way across the state, from the Kill Van Call all the way to the Delaware River. We face congestion on our roadways and our highways, strained commuter rail and transit systems, and local roads and bridges that are in desperate needs of repair. My constituents, um, like others around the country, were impacted by the supply chain uh, crises that, that every family in this country experienced. Um, and so, each of the, the urban, suburban, rural sect sections and, and uh, infrastructures are, all need to be considered and, and their interoperability, you know, as we're addressing our nation's priority transportation goals so we can make sure we have both safety and economic competitiveness. Um, Mr. Jeffries, as you stated in your, in your testimony, I'm gonna use this as a model for um, every one of the witnesses uh, here today that you said that rail yeah, as you know, rail is a vital part in the New Jersey economy. And if you say in your written testimony, the, great, the next great leap forward in safety directly relies on the ability of railroads to innovate and to deploy new technology. How can, and this is a question for every single one of the panelists, how can the Congress support um, the railroads and the other individuals um, testifying here today achieve your, um, their greatest potential in, de in deploying uh, technology that it does both improve safety, efficiency, and as we started here today, is also, but also is, is safe um, from a homeland security perspective, so we know that we have a, a, an entire grid that is safe. Well, that's a great question, and and one we could we could talk a lot about on. I'll just break it down into to two factors: one, effective oversight of the agencies and responsible for for regulating safety to ensure that. Their, their regulatory efforts are focused on object, uh, objective data-driven safety improvements. Mm -hmm. Two, really on the legislative side, looking at ways to, to champion innovation, to expand the ability to, to use pilot programs, to expand the ability to use waivers to demonstrate new ways and explore new ways of doing things, mm -hmm. to build that safety data set that can, uh, that can allow for a, an informed, educated, debate about whether or not you should move forward with it. Mm -hmm. um, this is not anti-worker. This is about creating a regulatory framework that keeps up with evolution of technology and innovation, and then adjusting worker roles and responsibilities to, uh, to take advantage of that so that they're able to be most effective. And there is a training component to that as well. Okay. A anybody else on the panel have additional you know, from the port, for example, or, or Greg, you guys yeah, have been. No, look, I, and I, <clears throat> as I said earlier, I, I believe that technology is an important, technological advancements are important, and there's something that we, as a labor movement, embrace. We might. Um, where we get, where I get really tired of it is when it's used purely as an excuse to lower headcount. And we see that in industries across the board. Um, our number one priority is to make sure that as we get new technology, it's done to enhance our ability to do our jobs, to make it safer. Mm -hmm. So that we know that um, you know it's another tool that can be at the at the disposal of the people who are experts in these fields and are able to do the job to the best of their ability. So we are all about trying to figure out a way to incorporate this and deploy it into the industries where our workers are. But we want to make sure it's done in a responsible way. And too often, it's viewed as an excuse to get rid of another worker. Thank you. I, I can just add, not about the railroads, but certainly. Well, I, I, I was using it as a basis for every single one of the issues. Yeah, areas so, so here sim to similarly, about. you know, it, technology is very important. We wouldn't be able to do the things that we do uh, and, and being efficient as we are as a port and terminal operators without the technologies that we have. 
Uh, but, the, but again, I, I agree, they, they, they have to be a tool for the worker. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they, we've been successful in that and uh, uh, creating better processes, but at the same time, uh, you know, it creates jobs. Uh, the more, more containers that you can handle through a terminal, for instance, the more uh, longshoremen that are gonna be, be uh, employed. So technology is a good thing and we need to embrace it and uh, use it correctly. It needs to be work with, with the partnership with the individual as well. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. I've, I've uh, yielded back the remainder of my time. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Van Orden, you're recognized. Just a reminder, we are up against the floor vote, so uh, members are reminded to keep your comments brief and tight, please. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, witnesses, I appreciate you coming here today. Um, I represent Wisconsin's third congressional district. It's comprised of 19 whole and partial counties, approximately 13,000 square miles. We have locks and dams running from Pierce County, which is uh, almost directly across from Minneapolis-St. Paul down to the Iowa-Illinois border, uh, across from Dubuque. That's uh, lock three to lock 11. Um, we also are an agrarian district, and we understand that it doesn't matter how much grain you uh, are able to produce in a field if it can't get to a processing facility and then get to a market, it might as well rot there. So the trucking industry is incredibly important. Uh, to my district, so thank you very much. Um, I've got long haul or over the road truckers in my family, um, and so I appreciate the work that you've done. Um, being the most junior member of this committee, um, all of the questions I was gonna ask you have been asked, so you're out. Um, and then, yeah, it's true. So Mr. Jeffries, um, I wanna thank you very much. We have the BNSF Railroad that runs nearly the uh, entire length of my district from uh, north to south, and so it's incredibly important to our economy also. Uh, again, all of my questions uh, have been asked, so you're out of luck. However, Mr. Firth, um, hey listen, we can spend all this monopoly money that the, this administration has been throwing at infrastructure, but if we don't have somebody to actually complete the work, it's not gonna happen. And I am not a fan of the federal government imposing restrictions and regulations on states. However, I'd like to ask you uh, this question. In the state of Wisconsin, they've established some artificial uh, limits on the amount of uh, apprentices that a single master tra a tradesman can have. So for instance, uh, a single plumber, master plumber, can only have two apprentices that can work uh, uh, underneath them simultaneously. So in your professional opinion, if we were to standardize the ability for our masters to have more uh, apprentices underneath them. What type of effect would that have on your workforce? Well, I can't speak, uh, I'm not a plumber. Um, I don't have any experience in that. I usually I sub that out. But um, as far as workforce goes though, you know, I mean, I don't think it would be a bad thing. You know, it's obviously gonna be probably cost more that's gonna have to be, you know, accumulated into the bids that, you know, that we would turn in or whatnot. I mean, if you add more people, I mean, I think there's other avenues for training, you know, that we could have for, uh, through apprenticeship programs and everything. I think the trades right now do a pretty good job of, of uh, having those, um, you know, ratios or whatever, you know, and everything. I mean, I'm an open shop contractor, so right. I can't really speak for, for the, how the unions work and everything. Um, but I mean, I, I think it would probably cost more. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gunther, if you could briefly, um, and maybe we should uh, take this later because I'm limited on time. Can you speak about the effects of the lack of maintenance on our locks and dams and the potentiality for the uh, effect on commerce? I'm sorry, the lack of? Uh, the maintenance on our locks and dams. Well, similar, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a big issue, similar to what we've been talking about today. You know, the O and M funding um, locks and um, on the inland waterways are very important. I know that we handle, you know, we're the largest ship channel in the country, but we know there's 200,000 barge movements right. in and around our facility. So making sure that we're maintaining all waterways, not only deep water, but shallow water, barge canals are, are extremely important and should be included um, in the funding process. Very well, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Reagan, reading your um, written testimony, I can only assume that you are not related to Ronald Reagan, is that correct? <laughs> no, uh, he fired the air traffic controllers. I'm lucky enough to represent that him. That is correct. Um, hey, so listen, man, I gotta tell you something. I did read your testimony and I'm gonna strongly encourage you to do something. 
change your tone. So I'm a retired senior enlisted Navy SEAL who dropped out of high school and got a GED. I've been supporting myself financially since I was 16 years old. So I consider myself a tradesman. And we have to work together collectively. But the tone of your written testimony uh, is not conducive to that. So I will reach across the aisle to my colleagues. I'm more than happy to work with union labor, absolutely. But we have to start uh, addressing each other in a more respectful manner. And I would just encourage you to do that. And I'm more than happy to work with you. And uh, with that, I yield back. Thanks, the gentleman. Mr. Ezell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In accordance with the committee rules, I ask for unanimous consent to submit a statement from the National Association of Waterfront Employers for the record. Without objection, so ordered. I'll try to talk fast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm grateful to have the chance to discuss the many social and economic benefits provided by a well-maintained transportation system. People want to feel comfortable that they can travel safely through our local communities and industries and need to know that their goods are delivered efficiently and safely at a reasonable cost. Mr. Speer, uh, I'm gonna start with you. It's clear from today's discussion there's a need to improve the nation's physical infrastructure to keep pace with our global competitors and address inflation. In your testimony, Mr. Speer, you mentioned how federal policies affect a state's ability to begin critical infrastructure improvements. Mr. Speer, how does biased left-leaning administrative cause, uh, guidance cause uncertainty for the projects in our states back home? I think I'd dial back to the Federal Highway Administration memo that we've been referencing throughout this hearing. You know, if, if everything is going so swimmingly well with handing states the monies they need to do these projects that, that they deem priority, then why have the memo? Mm -hmm. exactly. Why have it? Mm -hmm. You're just breeding confusion including my industry, but certainly in states like yours. So you know, I, I get rid of the memo. Stop playing games. I know why it's there. It's like environmental lobby doesn't want any more cars and trucks on the roads. That's why. So it's to appease them. Let's say this is a lot of money. It's a law handed to them to administer. There's plenty there to go around, even with inflation. This is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I think states you know, need to be hand in glove working with the Federal Highway Administration to get these projects funded and underway. So. That eliminates a lot of confusion, just get rid of the memo. I think as far as emergency uh, response, I understand you have a lot of wisdom in this department, um, making certain that the Secretary of Transportation and governors like that in Mississippi have strong lines of authority and communication to ensure that we can respond to instances like hurricanes, but also things that aren't covered under emergency declarations like the Colonial Pipeline, mm. COVID-19. Okay, these are things where we really need to break down barriers and work together. And I know you have a lot of experience in that, and I look forward to working with you on it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gunther, uh, the ports of Mississippi Gulf Coast are unique in terms of types of services, but they're all similarly dependent on, upon regular maintenance of their navigation channels and approaches. In your testimony, you touched on this briefly, but can you talk more about the importance of channel deepening and widening projects, and the maintenance of dredging performed by the Army Corps of Engineers. Also, what are some specific challenges you have faced with these projects, and how can Congress help? Well, the uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Certainly, uh, Houston uh, is, uh, and, and the rest of the uh, ports in the Mississippi Co Gulf Coast have similar issues uh, with, with maintaining the dredge. And I think uh, there's a lot of uh, certainly togetherness in, in that. And as we move forward, we just need to make sure, like I mentioned before, that we are getting O&M funding to do that, to keep them. All these channels are at their, are they're authorized uh, to be at a certain depth and a certain with for a reason to serve the economy of the United States of America, and we ought to spend the money to make sure that we um, keep keep those at their authorized depths so, so that we can have the efficient flow and competitive uh, commerce in, in this country. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, chair has been notified there will be a series of votes occurring on the House floor. The committee shall stand in recess, subject to call the chair.
The Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure will reconvene, and I recognize myself for five minutes. It's a crazy day, isn't it? Um, I, my questions are going to be a little bit different, and I, I just wanted your thoughts in general. You're in different areas of industry and business and transportation. Um, and I want to say from the get-go that I certainly am supportive of, of renewable energies and a cleaner planet and trying to do everything that we could do. Um, I'm also supportive of the idea that I want America always to be number one, and we should never be ashamed of it. We have to be the best. And I have a little bit of concern because of that, and it, you, you deal with all this, that some of the requirements that are going to, that do exist or may exist in the future uh, are going to make it a little bit more difficult for you at times. It's going to be hard to do, you know, I was here earlier on the day, some of the discussions of all the things that are required. So making sure that everything's running the way that government sees it isn't always necessarily best for business or the easiest for business. So when it comes to the supply chain, you know, I believe that part of it is, exists, the, the problems that we have with it to some degree exist because of some of the changes that we may be trying to make, quite frankly and candidly, a little bit too quickly. I believe that it can be good. We have more to learn. Um, so with that, I would ask you just, each one of you quickly to say what you think the greatest challenge is and without getting nervous, I promise nobody will yell at you if in some ways you're being pushed too hard or you know, we could just slow it down a little bit and make sure that we are competing. Because last thing I'll leave with you, again, not necessarily in all of if, in what you're involved in, but in many forms of business industry and en energy particularly, we are putting all these requirements upon ourselves, for example, in energy. But we're not really the problem whether people want to admit it or not. And India is not, China is not, uh, Russia is not, and many other countries are not putting these requirements upon themselves. So it's sort of like say, well, we're gonna be perfect, it's gonna cost us more, it's gonna be harder, we're gonna create issues, we're gonna to have to buy more stuff from other people because of all these requirements. That's not necessarily a good thing. So I just wanted some, some general thoughts on that. And I know um, everybody was touching on you about, well, what are you doing about this? And how are you gonna make sure everything's exactly perfect, you know, in, in the, the brave new world? I'd like to see the other viewpoint. So Chris, I'll start with you. We just go right down the line. Sure, I, listen, as I said in my opening statement, and hopefully conveyed throughout the hearings, let's just be realistic. That's all, just put all, the headwinds that we're gonna face as a country to get to zero. It'll come, it'll happen eventually. But this rush that we're seeing, this timeline is simply unachievable. It's gonna be embarrassing because we're not gonna hit it. We're not gonna have the infrastructure in place. Let's just say we did. We're not gonna have the power to put into it because we haven't invested and opened that up. And we're not gonna have access to the minerals needed to create the batteries that go into these trucks. I had an instance in, in uh, Joliet, Illinois, a member uh, built a 30 stall, not a big stall, uh, facility, but a 30 stall uh, distribution center there. Uh, well, let's just electrify it. And uh, they submitted the plans. The city of Joliet shows up a few days later and said, what are you building here? It's like, what do you mean? It's a truck terminal. I said, you're asking for more power for this 30 stall facility than the entire city of Joliet. That's the disconnect, and that's not solved exactly. overnight. So let's be realistic about it. Let's put all the headwind on the table. And let's come up with a timeline that works. And uh, we're all in on that, but that, that has to be transparent. Yeah, I, government can obviously, you know, policy can, can help drive the process forward, but the market's gotta be able to, to react and innovate in order to meet those top line goals. And you can facilitate, you can support, you can take a, a carrot approach, but to, to Chris's point, you have to look at things holistically and just demanding one thing in, in you know, one, one area here without considering the, the, the consequences or the inputs required from another part of uh, the process, you just end up in a, in a backward situation where you're being, you know, jerked back and forth and trying to figure out just, you know, what the path forward is. So 
it just requires a, a holistic, clear-eyed approach. Yeah, uh, for, for me, I think it's the, uh, the administrative burdens that are going to be coming down the pipeline, I think. Um, you know, I, I, to comply with all these federal requirements, you know, as it gets uh, more complicated and everything, I mean, I, we've got 215 employees, uh, you know, that we look after. Um, we've got an office full of maybe 15 people. And I kind of think, you know, if all of a sudden Buy America, do I have to hire somebody just to be an expert in Buy America, for instance? And then I also kind of think about, okay, what about some of these smaller firms that don't have those resources or, or those capabilities to be an expert in Buy America? So somehow or another, we got to be a little simpler and, uh, you know, Simple's better. I agree with you. Just a thought about the supply okay. chain from a just poor perspective. Supply chain disruption was really due to one thing, and that was just a historic demand on the system uh, that wasn't able to absorb it. There wasn't a thing, there hadn't been a single thing really that has fixed it so far, uh, except for that the demand has gone down. We've learned a lot. We need to continue to look at more efficient movement of freight of goods with with lower emissions that achieve the goals that we need to and 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 I would just say let's don't get overly aggressive with the rules that fix it going forward. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, used to getting yelled Time's at. Time's expired, but go ahead, you finish up. <laughs> getting me uh, and upset, but uh, I would just say we need to have the workforce uh, in place to be able to meet the 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 consumer demand that we're going to have, both from a from a passenger and freight perspective, and we also need to be, rebuild our manufacturing cap capacity. Uh, so that we're not completely reliant on on foreign countries for the the critical materials that we need uh, to rebuild in a in a greener and a better way. Time's expired. I appreciate you guys. I'm going to recognize now Mr. Williams, Representative Williams, for a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, we certainly cover a broad swath of uh, transportation here. So thank you for your time. Uh, you know, I had the benefit of uh, attending the Wharton School and studying operations under Patrick Harker and Professor, Professor uh, Marshall Fisher, if you've ever uh, come across either of them. Uh, so I have a, a slight understanding of, uh, you know, queuing theory and, and OR models and some of the things, I think, the tools that you use. Um, but more importantly, I played the beer game. And uh, before you... Uh, other, my colleagues here think it's that beer game, it's actually the supply chain beer game, which I think perhaps many of you have, have played or, or members of your team has. And, and the, the idea of it is that uh, in any kind of supply chain across multiple distribution points, uh, if you don't have visibility and transparency in data, that you make some very egregious decisions and assumptions about supply and demand and capacity and utilization and all those things. And um, I notice in the petroleum industry, they have the Energy Information Administration, a little bit different function. I know it's a, you know, it's a commodity, it's much simpler, but the industry cooperates in ways that shares data and visibility around uh, supplies, uh, storage, transport, all of these kinds of things that seem to uh, make things move a little bit simpler. And it's really an open-ended question. Are you aware of any uh, in industry or uh, federally sponsored uh, clearinghouses or brokerages of real-time or, or time-relevant data, whatever that is, if it's daily or weekly or hourly, whatever it is, that, that is giving uh, visibility of supply chain information um, that makes your jobs easier, that makes you more efficient? Is there a role to be played uh, by the federal government to broker this kind of exchange of information uh, that helps you do your job better? Is that something you've considered or is there something I should be aware of and I can look into? I'm happy to take a first crack at that. Um, in the rail industry, actually, my organization is a, a primary clearinghouse for data along those lines. We have a wholly owned subsidiary 
uh, called Raillink in Cary, North Carolina. That is the kind of the IT backbone of information sharing and information transfer because we are an interconnected network and uh, exchange traffic, exchange business across lines so much that, that tracking that's critically important. Um, also, we're required to submit a vast amount of uh, reporting data to our economic regulator, the Surface Transportation Board, and all that data is generated in-house uh, in my shop. I'll also say there's, there's a pretty significant push uh, recognizing that the, the Amazonification of the world has occurred. And, you know, when I order a pizza, I want to know uh, when the, the pepperoni's going on it before it goes in the oven. And so there's a lot of work in telematics and real-time sensor tracking, et cetera, in the industry. Um, there's a joint uh, company that's been stood up with uh, railroads, uh, short lines, class ones, car owners, car leasers, really working to, to make headway there. So there's a lot of efforts afoot. Uh, you know, I understand, that, like, with rolling stock and, and uh, maybe you know, to manage capacity across a rail line. Again, not my area of expertise. Um, but what about like bill of lading? You know, what, what about the actual flow of materials that allows, you know, companies to uh, communicate better? And again, if you've played the beer game, you know what I'm talking about is that, uh, you know, uh, the, as, if you have better data transparency, uh, it, it really makes a huge difference, um, you know, in how things flow. And again, if this doesn't exist, if it's something we should look at uh, or that you think has obvious barriers, <clears throat> like no one would do that, then uh, do, then let me know, so. At the risk of dominating the conversation, um, that, that is an issue we ran into during some of the, the, the container uh, supply chain challenges from, from port to truck or port to rail to, to inland yard and uh, to final destination of warehouses. You know, a lot of times your, your, your contracts with the, uh, with the, the ocean carrier, and you don't know who, the, who the, the beneficial cargo owner is or what's in the box, and so you're, you're kind of playing a guess game about where you're positioning your boxes in the yard, and uh, the, uh, just some simple knowledge transfer, you know, I know our folks have said would, would allow for uh, an easier transition of product. Yeah, I agree, there, there's, there's information there. It's just become the sharing of that information for competitive reasons or whatever it is, is that likely to occur? And it's not occurring today, but there's a lot of data out there. It's just not being exchanged. Thank you. And I, maybe the government could be a good faith broker in some way of data, but thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Molinaro for five minutes. For uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, all of you. I know it's been a, a long day. I, I um, was here earlier uh, uh, during some of the conversation regarding the pandemic. I spent the last 12 years as, uh, as a county executive in, in New York local government. I just want to acknowledge uh, first and foremost uh, that you and the folks you represent uh, really during a time of great challenge uh, rose to the occasion. Uh, and frankly, uh, we, we, we ought not forget that. Uh, the challenge uh, that we all faced and uh, the determination in many ways, although I didn't agree with the, the language, uh, of the essential work uh, that, uh, that that the folks that you you represent here uh, really uh, uh, offer the American people uh, over those two years. Um, uh, having uh, listened to a conversation about beer and pizza, I'm suddenly very very hungry. But um, that said, um, I want to return um, uh, to uh, my experience uh, during those those 12 years in local government. Um, and uh, uh, Jeff, if I could. Uh, uh, Rural communities in particular are underrepresented uh, in um, uh, inflation calculations. Uh, the, 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 the miles that have to be traveled to move projects, the lack of uh, workforce, uh, the supply chain issues really uh, are exacerbated uh, in rural communities. Can you talk for a moment in particular, if you can localize it for me, meaning New York, um, and to the extent you can, I'll accept it. To the extent you can't, I'll accept it. But can you, can you talk to um, the, the, the real life burden uh, and the challenge we now have in more rural communities uh, to move infrastructure projects in particular? Absolutely, I mean, uh, I can't speak to, to New York, but um, you know, we, like for instance, we've got a project out at Yellowstone National Park where we're, re we're replacing a bridge. And you wouldn't really think about um, the logistics that need to go into of getting materials in and out of the park, but also too from our workforce on, you know, if you're working six days a week, um, they got to go to the store and get groceries, they got to get laundry done, um, they've got to drive back and forth, you know, I mean, these rural areas are, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to um, get the infrastructure in place to support, call it the project that's actually happening. Uh, so I, I would say that um, it's not insurmountable, 
but um, you just got to think kind of outside the box and, and be proactive. And uh, it's why actually I took a little issue with a slide we saw earlier uh, during the hearing. Um, you know, I'd offer $10 billion in 2022, doesn't, doesn't go as far as $8 billion did in 2021. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with uh, both uh, inflation, uh, the supply chain issues, uh, and, and the challenges that we have in, in rural America to move projects. Um, I, I, was appreci I appreciated your reference uh, in your testimony uh, to uh, Secretary uh, Buttigieg's comment, uh, no one understands a, a community's need better than those who live there. I wonder, Jeff, and, and maybe Chris, if you could, in, in, in the few moments I have left, um, uh, my concern is that uh, the uh, infrastructure dollars flow to state governments and don't often make it to the ground. I know, I know that I look very young, uh, but I'm old enough to remember the last infrastructure bill uh, in, in 2008, uh, and in the state of New York, very few dollars found their way to actual projects. Uh, could you perhaps just reflect on that? Uh, I'm concerned in particular uh, that uh, state government, in, in, at least again localizing it, New York, consumes too much uh, of those dollars and, and that we didn't build in enough of a drive to localize it uh, and I would say, I do not take the plea, a, plead, uh, a plea agreement on that, on that highway administration memo. I think it does send a message that there's a priority and it isn't necessarily what those in the local communities feel is necessary. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think having the, uh, the, the state governments have their own um, decision making on what's best for what their communities are, right? I mean, they're, they're living and breathing it. They understand what their needs are better than I think than say a one size fits all policy, you know, uh, coming from, from Washington. Um, so I, 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 that's, I think that's how I'd answer that. And, and maybe to Chris, is there, as, same, same question, but is there a concern that the states gobble up those dollars before they get to, to, to local communities, cities, counties, et cetera? Well, that's been the trend, but I think also we've lacked, you know, the kind of spending that you witness in the IIJA. Love it or hate it, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, even with inflation, there's a lot of money going out the door, and that's why we have oversight, to make certain that it's being spent correctly. Uh, I do think uh, smaller communities that are generally 80%, if not more, dependent on trucks to deliver their daily goods do get generally less of a voice on such matters. Um, but their infrastructure, in most instances, are a lot less expensive than, say, you know, around very heavily urban populated areas. So. Uh, I do think it's important for hearings like this, groups like ours, to make certain that they're not lost, that they are getting the dollars, because those roads still need to be maintained. We still need to make certain that we're delivering uh, just in time. So, you know, people want it faster today than they used to. COVID, we saw, you know, us move more to, I want it in, you know, two days or less. That's shifted our entire industry radically to warehousing things regionally, to get things to people's door, but it takes more drivers, takes more equipment to do that, and we need infrastructure to get it on. So a lot of that's in rural communities, and they can't be lost. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you. And I now recognize Mr. James for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd also like to take another moment to, uh, to thank you and applaud you for your stamina, your patience, and the work that you put in, not just today, but each and every single day. I um, ran a supply chain logistics company, automotive, in Detroit, uh, deal with uh, trucking, rail, each and every single day uh, to satisfy our customers and to help grow our economy. Um, I was asked recently by a reporter in reference to uh, what you're hearing about the, uh, the, the debt ceiling and, uh, and, and this meeting that's going on with the president and the speaker today, and they asked me specifically, well, what are you gonna cut? And I responded, we're gonna cut harmful regulations that make it more difficult to bring jobs back from Mexico and China. We're going to cut taxes to make it more easy to get uh, folks the money that they've earned and so that they can take care of themselves and their families. So to those ends, or what we're going to cut to make things easier to do business, to make it more hospitable to do business in America, I, I need you to inform us how we can keep our promises to the taxpayers, to our constituents, to our customers, to lower prices, bring back jobs, and keep our communities safer. By expounding a little bit, and this is to no one in particular, because you all have expertise here, and I only have three minutes, but uh, how do we help remove unnecessary bottlenecks? What are the onerous uh, uh, regulations that, that, that we can get out of your way so you can be more successful? And what technological uh, improvements 
can we assist with helping you move forward? I'm not shy. Um, you know, I, so one, I think, as, as an industry that, that spends average $24 billion of our own, our own capital every year, putting it back into our network, it's, it, and, and also partners with you know, states, localities on, on public grant programs for projects of, of big significance um, throughout the country. It's how do we put that money to work more quickly? How do we get through uh, reviews, permitting, et cetera, in a, a much more predictable, um, rational way that provides certainty to, to our folks who are making investment decisions? Again, uh, all folks need a certainty about what to expect and, and they can manage that process. Two, it's really looking at the, the, the regulatory uh, framework and how do we make sure it's focused on the future? How do we make sure it's focused on innovation? How does it champion technological deployment? Um, how do we modernize the regulatory structure? And that doesn't mean, you know, always just getting rid of regulations. It's adjusting for the present day and for the future so that we can be more nimble and we can, we can evolve as, as required. Um, I mean, we could go on and on, but I don't, I don't want to take it. You have two minutes. <laughs> That's fine. I was told I talk too much, so no. not <laughs> I, you. I would just, not you, me. I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I would just say, listen, uh, I, 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 really quick, I think the bottlenecks have been very much covered. I think they're going to be released next week. We'll certainly send it up to you. You can prioritize and see where everybody ranks around the country. That's a roadmap. That's where DOT should be centering its gravity. Alleviating congestion brings down inflation. It improves safety. It, it lowers fuel burn. It lowers emissions. These are all good things. There's something in that for everybody. And it's such an easy list to look at. You can see where, it, where it's happening. On the more regulatory front, we talked earlier about our workforce. Listen, you know, with all these states, Canada included, legalizing recreational marijuana, we need tools to deal with this. We need hair testing. Okay, beyond your analysis, we need to make certain that people getting behind the wheel of an 80,000 pound vehicle are not impaired. And we wanna work with you that. And that channel conflict on the regulatory front between HHS and DOT is real. They do not communicate. They are not willing to cut a deal on this thing. We've told them to do this, legislated this, and now we're back before you again to deal with it. This is gonna create a very litigious environment if we do not deal with the regulatory framework that oversees an interstate commerce industry like ours. So hair testing would be very uh, appreciated, and we look forward to working with you on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're back. I now recognize Mr. Duarte for five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, the Chairman. Appreciate being here today. Uh, I represent a rural district in California that sits right outside of San Francisco. We ship a lot of almonds out of our district. We ship a tremendous amount of ag commodities to West Coast ports. And we also have a large commuter pool that travels or tries to travel daily from Lathrop, north parts of north, northern and southern parts of my district into the Bay Area, one of the most dynamic job markets in the world. And I'm very concerned about two things, and I'll welcome answers from any of you. I've read all of your comments that were submitted, so um, thank you for that. One is, are my constituents getting their best bang for their buck out of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, or is America hamstringing our ability to add the lanes that working families need to get to work uh, with carbon, carbon by American? Um, do we have the power grid to support a long-term production of domestic building supplies, rebar? Does anybody want to build a steel plant in America today with the carbon uh, policies hanging over us. Um, I'd, I'd like some very candid answers to that. And then we've also understood that on the port side, a great deal of our, of our backlogging at the ports, um, there have been some bank reports. I know Rabobank did, a, did a, a very extensive report on nut supply chain issues, peanuts, walnuts, almonds, pistachios, and really pointed out shipping company consolidation in the last decade as being a major culprit of the, uh, I would call it planned scarcity of shipping capacity that spiked revenues and uh, increased shipping, shipping company profits extraordinarily. So please, any of you that would like to yeah, address any of those issues, I'll welcome. To answer your first question about um, whether or not people want to make steel plants in this country, I've spoken to iron, steel, aluminum manufacturers. They want to expand their capacity. They're ready to do that. Um, and we want to help them do that. 
and if we want to define how we're getting the best bang for our buck, um, if you want to be able to have the cheapest stuff, that's one way to define it. Um, in my view, invest, making sure that we're using this massive expenditure to also invest in our communities. That means investing in our manufacturing capacity as a country, so we're not relying on overseas for manufactured goods. I think that is a really good bang for our buck long term for our country. I also think investing in good jobs, making sure that there are decent wages and decent benefits so that people have disposable income to reinvest in their communities, that is a pretty darn good bang for your buck. Uh, in addition to delivering really high quality transportation systems in this country, uh, I think doing it the right way has monumental benefits outside of just the new roads or the new train route. Uh, I think that we can actually invest in our communities and our people in a way that we haven't always done in the past. Excellent, thank you. I would just add that, uh, are they getting the bang for their buck? You know, I made some comments earlier about, you know, your, your uh, agricultural constituents, people growing not, walnuts, shipping around the country, you know, should uh, the assets in an efficient supply chain, whether that's in the waterways or the highways or the infrastructure, get it to and from the port efficiently should be first and foremost. And, you know, the the more we can put on the ship and the quicker we can get it through our ports, uh, the better off for your constituents. So uh, I agree. Um, I mean, in in summary, my platform is abundance. We need abundant food, abundant energy, yep. and logistics are a major factor in abundance. And abundance to working families is affordability. And my district is yep. entirely working families. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, uh, an efficient terminal you know, the trucker deserves a clean run through there. Uh, you know, the need to be serving the rail, all of the modes of the supply chain need to be efficient or it's passed on to the consumer, whether it's an import or an export of those goods. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the best bang for the buck, I mean, the American people are gonna see it, maybe not right now, but later. I mean, I think back to like when the, uh, the highway system was built back in what, the 50s and the 60s, it probably wasn't recognized right at that moment but it catapulted America later on down the road. I think that's where something today is, is that um, with the IIJA money, we're gonna be able to see that that's gonna take America further down the road. And be is it going to manifest itself in markedly better freeways, easier commutes to work, better logistics in our, in our products and goods getting to markets and getting to consumers in ways that improve their lives? I think so. Are there ways to make that even better? Well, I mean, you've kind of heard me talk about permitting, you know, and everything. That's kind of one of my hot buttons is, is that, you know, streamlining permitting. It, we got to get it built first, right, and everything. And so, I mean, if we want greener and faster and everything better, it starts with permitting. We got to figure that out. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> and the gentleman yields back. Are there further questions from any member of the committee who have not been previously recognized? Seeing none, that concludes our hearing for today. I would like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remains open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.